Okay, we want to welcome everyone to the February 18th, 2020 school board meeting for Lexington School District 1. Uh, do I hear a motion to enter into executive session to consider employment recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year, employment recommendations for the 2020-2021 school year, a property matter related to bus transport to a bus transportation facility, and a property contractual matter related to the town of Lexington road improvements adjacent to Lexington Elementary and Lexington Middle Schools. So moved. Okay. We now have a motion and a second on the floor. Are there any questions or comments? We got a, a motion. You need a second. second. See, she did a second. Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries, and we are now in executive session. We want to welcome everyone to the February 18th, 2020 school board meeting. Um, we are now calling ourselves to order and we hope everyone had a great Valentine's Day and we are just motoring towards spring. I was thinking about that today. We're going to blink our eye and we'll be at graduation. And I know Sheila, she's at graduation every year. I see her and I see a lot of you, so it'll be here before we know it. Anyway, do I hear a motion to conclude executive session and begin open session? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Um, are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, and it is unanimous. Um, I would like to call to order the general session of the February 18th, 2020 school board meeting. The district is in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act. We have notified the media of the date, time, and place of this meeting. We would like to inform you that the district tapes the meeting for accuracy in preparing the minutes. And at this time, um, I'm going to call on Dr. Powers, who will lead us in our invocation. Dr. Powers? So if you'll join me and bow your heads. Loving and gracious God, you are indeed the giver of all good gifts. And we thank you today for all your blessings, for the successful outcomes of our school events, and for all our staff members, both teaching and support. We ask you bless them abundantly, and we continue to seek your wisdom, guidance, courage, and strength. Be with us in our deliberations and help us to be wise in the decisions we make for good of those who have placed their trust and confidence in our leadership. Give us insight to lead with integrity, that our decisions may reflect what is good and right. Help us to make decisions that are good for all and guard us from self-interest. And finally, dear Lord, dear Lord, grant us the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say. And we specifically tonight ask you to be with our sister community in Casey, the family, friends, teachers, students, and community members who knew Faye. As a district itself who's experienced such tragedy, we offer our support, our love, our prayers that we take from Philippians, that the peace of God, which surpasses and exceeds all understanding, will guard Casey's heart and mind in the days and weeks to come. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Okay. Um, let's see. Mo uh, board, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as, pre as presented? Do I have a motion? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments regarding the agenda board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the agenda as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Okay. Um, board members, you have been provided copies of the minutes for the, Jan for the January 21st, 2020 regular board meeting. Other than the corrections already provided and made, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of that meeting? Hearing none, we will accept the minutes as received. Uh, we're going to go to 7.0, which are reports and action items from executive session. Do I hear a motion to approve 24 certified recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year? Um, Madam Chair, I think it's 24 for the 2020-21 school year, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. Mike, can you help us there? Yeah. So, so it's the 2020-2021? Yep. Okay. So, so let me reread that. Do I? And there's and there's one for the 2019-2020. Okay. They've just got them backwards. Yep. Okay. 
So, board, do I hear a motion to approve 24 cer certified recommendations for the 2020-2021 school year, Dr. Powers? Madam Chair, I move the board accept Dr. Little and the senior leadership team's recommendation for the 24 certified positions for the 2020-2021 school year. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Um, and before we vote, um, Mr. Stacy, and that's a lot of positions at this time of year. Were most of those the result of the teacher recruitment fair? Get out a loud voice anyway. Um, we did the recruitment fair in January. It was really successful. Um, had a lot of teachers that had a lot of experience come in and talk with us about jobs. And so we've been working really, really hard the last couple of weeks trying to do references and complete those packages. And today I talked with them. We still have probably 20 or 30 that are in the pike that we'll do at the next board meeting. Well, so we're pretty excited about that's that. Great news. Well, that's wonderful. I was there and I think Miss Green was there. It was a wonderful day. And all the principals I talked to said they had they just the caliber of candidates was just superb. So thank you. That's wonderful. You walked in and there was the smell of fresh baked chocolate chip cookies. How can yeah. you not be eager to come work in Lex Lexington <laughs> one? It did. It smelled delicious. <laughs> so we now have a motion and a second on the floor. Are there any other questions or comments board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the 24 certified recommendations for the 2020 2021 school year, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Do I hear a motion to approve one certified recommendation for the 2019 2020 school year? Madam Chair, move the board accept Dr. Little and the senior leader, leader, leadership team's recommendation for the one certified position for the 2019 2020 school year. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments, board, regarding that one per position? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Do I hear a motion to approve one administrative recommendation for the 2020-2021 school year? Madam Chair, move that the board accept Dr. Little and the senior leadership team's recommendation for the one administrative position for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding that one administrative position board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Uh, board, in front of you, there is a motion regarding the bus transportation facility. Do I have a motion regarding the bus transportation facility? Madam Chair, I move that the board authorize the administration to enter into an option agreement related to two parcels. These parcels are known by Lexington County as number one, TMS number 005498-07-014, containing approximately 44.27 acres with Royalty Holdings 1 LLC. Second property, TMS number 005498-07-015, containing approximately 2.61 acres with Royalty Properties LLC. This is for the purpose of building a new transportation facility. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guyton. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Um, we'll go ahead and turn this over to Mr. Salters and let him kind of walk us through this um, property that he's looking at. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, <clears throat> this evening, I'm bringing you um, some considerations that we looked at in looking at the property for a new transportation facility. Um, Obviously, we wanted something that was centrally located uh, in the community to be able to serve our Lexington, River Bluff, and White Knoll communities um, so that we could get some economies of scale out of the buildings that we would build. Um, and the property that we're bringing for you tonight actually is 4.1 miles from White Knoll High, 6.9 from Lexington, and 8.7 from River Bluff. Um, Obviously, an industrial area is preferred uh, for an operation like this. Our buses start um, rolling very early in the morning. Uh, they actually get out there and get uh, make startups sometimes as early as 5 or, you know, 4.45 in the morning. So um, you can have a lot of noise from some diesel engines um, bright and early, and we try to stay away from a residential neighborhood doing that. Um, good sight distances with multiple access points are important as well. Um, really would like to have access points where employees could drive their cars uh, in and out in a separate driveway uh, from buses. And so um, that's, that's what we kind of looked for as we were looking for a site. 
And I just remind you of the current site that, that we're operating on for the River Bluff and Lexington area. Um, Bar Road uh, kind of runs up through here, and this site sits off of um, directly off of Bar Road, um, and it's currently um, actually owned by the State Department of Education, um, and th the district's been leasing that uh, for a number of years and operating out of uh, multiple portable classrooms uh, that are located here at the at the front of the site. Um, and there are a number of issues with this site. Obviously, uh, it's not large enough to handle the um, white knoll buses as well. And we have a number of drainage issues. You can see a limited uh, retention pond in the back. When it rains here, many of these buses are actually underwater, um, almost up to the door. Uh, so it, it's really problematic uh, for us. Um, so a new, new facility is long overdue. And so we're looking at a site um, off of Two Notch Road. Um, just to orient you, I-20 is here, uh, South Lake Drive is here, so um, this is the major intersection um, here uh, where Lexington County has some um, municipal services and Laredak is also located here. Um, and so you come down two notch and the site is located um, right in this area right here uh, with, with backing up to, um, to I-20. Uh, just a closer zoom in of the site. The two parcels, there's uh, one small parcel here on the front, uh, the 2.61 acres approximately, and then the larger track in the back. And um, it actually has um, a, a drive access point here, one here, and then we would um, want to get this as well for another access point in, in the uh, front section here. Uh, just looking at the topography of the land, um, it's obviously it's been cleared up in this area. Uh, it is relatively flat uh, over the um, duration of that area. Um, there's a pond that slopes down to this area here, and then it's um, again gets to a more flat space uh, down in the lower portion of the property as well. Um, here's that pond area that uh, we would make use of uh, for storm uh, detention and um, runoff. It's about two and a half acres overall, uh, which is about 5.3% of the overall uh, property there. And so, um, you know, just again to orient you, this is um, the site here. Um, you know, we would, we would envision our buses being able to come out the, the back side here to get over to the Lexington attendance area um, and, and also up this way um, as well. And then the River Bluff attendance area starts up in here, so easy access right into that area. And of course, you're in the White Knoll area right here, so um, easy access to the White Knoll community as well. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have related to the site. Can you kind of walk us through what buildings you're proposing and how many buses it would hold? Sure. Um, we would uh, propose um, and actually have a design for a building that's similar to our operations building that's out uh, behind Lexington High School, um, where it has uh, uh, office spaces in the front of the building for our transportation staff and then in, in the middle of the building would be a training area uh, for our, our bus drivers and then the rear of the building would be a uh, service bays uh, to work on our buses um, and so that would be located um, most likely on the the top end of the site um, up in this area <clears throat> approximately 160 buses would would be parked um, on the site currently you know in our current environment and of course, we um, only see that growing when we're adding 500 students a year. We'll continue to add buses um, to these areas. Um, the propane uh, buses that we recently got from the state would be um, housed here, and the fill station would be uh, moved to this location as well um, to service those buses. And then, Mr. Salters, this is part of our 2018 bond referendum, correct? So, I mean, this is what, at some point, we've got to move forward with this, correct? That, that's correct. We um, we did have it listed as a project in the 18 referendum to build a transportation facility to consolidate um, these facilities. We also, by moving the, <clears throat> the buses off of the White Knoll campus, um, we will regain some space there at White Knoll. A few classroom spaces will be repurposed um, for White Knoll High School, which they desperately need as well. Okay. Board, any other questions <coughs> or comments from Mr. Salters? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor of the motion as presented by Dr. Guyton, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm opposed. Okay, so we have six, four, and one against. Okay, thank you. Five, four. Five, four. I'm sorry, Mike's not here. Sorry about that.
Okay, five and five in favor and one opposed. Okay, do I hear a motion regarding a property contractual matter related to the town of Lexington Road improvements adjacent to Lexington Elementary and Lexington Middle Schools? Madam Chair, I, I move that the board accept the administration's recommendation to move into a right of way agreement with the town of Lexington for the purpose of road improvements adjacent to Lexington Elementary and also Lexington Middle Schools. Okay, thank you, Mr. Oswald. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Um, at this point, we'll turn it back over to Mr. Salters and have him walk us through this one. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, this is a request to enter into a right-of-way agreement with uh, the town of Lexington. As you recall, the town, uh, through their uh, road improvements and the one-way pairs that they're doing um, in the town of Lexington, have, have already started some improvements. Uh, the one-way pair actually picks up right here at the end of um, North Lake Drive and goes into the town. Uh, what this is doing essentially is right now this is uh, one lane in either direction. And if you go up here um, pretty much any time of day, you're going to be sitting backed up probably almost to Azalea Drive because it's it's one lane until it gets right up to the uh, red light and then it's, it opens up to two lanes. This improvement will open uh, a second lane all the way down uh, in front of Lexington Elementary, uh, starting basically at, at the property of Lexington Elementary and going all the way up through uh, through that signal. So it should improve traffic flow significantly in that area. And so the town is uh, seeking some right away to be able to do that and move their utilities and um, put that lane in there. Um, also, as part of this improvement, Dreer Street would be closed, so that signal um, leg of the signal would not operate anymore and this property um, in this area would be uh, given to the district. Um, the town currently owns that property and then Dreer Street would be relocated around this way. Um, this area right here, Azalea Drive, where it used to be, uh, would be closed off in this section here and so the district would essentially create a parcel uh, of land that would be marketable as a commercial uh, real estate uh, parcel. Uh, out of this as well uh, in this area here. Um, and so um, just kind of fast forward, this is the overall uh, flow of the improvement continued on. This is Lexington Middle School, <clears throat> the current site. And so that, that two lanes would continue on um, and uh, you know reach uh, up here where Moe's and all of that area is, and there's gonna be some through traffic lanes and so forth there. That's really not affected as part of this, but it does it does come in into play um, on Lexington Middle School site because they are going to close some driveway accesses uh, when this is done. Um, this is a schematic of of the property that would be uh, essentially swapped in this uh, agreement. The green uh, property here is property that we currently own uh, that we would um, give to the town, and then the blue is property the town owns that they would give to us. The orange uh, area is uh, roadway, a uh, public roadway that um, you know we would petition to have closed um, along with the town, and then that property would become the adjacent property owner's property. So in, in this case, um, this half of the road would become ours, and and that half would become this property owner's, and so forth. So um, essentially, we're given um, given up about 1.06 acres, um, and we're, we would be getting in return uh, one point you know, 584 acres um, with the town. And also um, advancing this improvement that's this much needed in front of our school. Um, along with this, I would just point out um, that we, we would also, this is probably the best way, way to look at it, we would also, um, on our site, um, we're working with SEDOT uh, and the Office of School Facilities to include a stacking loop that would come in uh, down in this area of our property and, and make its way across at the campus and then feed into the main driveway. So um, that would increase stacking significantly on the Lexington Elementary School campus. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about that. Board, any questions or comments for Mr. Salters? I guess obviously the town is um, pretty set with this plan and, and I mean they have different alternative avenues to secure the land. So this, this barter or broker where we get something in return is probably good for us, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I call it a good partnership. That's yeah. right. Okay. Any other questions or comments, board? 
Okay, hearing none, we'll take a vote. Um, this is the motion regarding the property contractual matter related to the town of Lexington Road improvements adjacent to Lexington Elementary and Lexington Middle. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. At this time, we're going to move to 8.0, which is honors and achievements. And um, Dr. Little is not feeling very well tonight, and he thinks he may have some germs. <laughs> um, so we are going to ask Dr. Tally if she wouldn't mind uh, coming down, and she is going, I don't know if you'll have the pizzazz and the energy of Dr. Little, but <laughs> I don't think anybody does. But anyway, and if y'all see him fall out and I'm over here reading, y'all kind of wave and <laughs> tell me he's, he's, he's falling out. Um, Tonight, we celebrate successes of many kinds during our honors and achievements portion of our board meeting. We recognize our students who are first place state level award winners, first, second, and third place national level award and achievement winners, as well as international competition winners and other one-of-a-kind awards. We also recognize our staff's awards, recognitions, and grants, and celebrate the contributions of and partnerships with our business partners and community organizations. Tonight, we our honorees are featured in our proof positive newsletter. Let's see, I think I have a copy right here. And uh, which was on the sign in table with the agenda as you came in. And if you didn't pick one up, make sure you take one home. And that's a great keepsake. However, you sh sometimes the honorees will appear in a different order. I will read them in a different order than they appear in proof positive. So don't panic if it doesn't quite match. We ask that you stay until we finish recognizing all of tonight's award recipients, recipients as each award winner deserves our undivided attention. However, to accommodate our youngest honorees and maybe some of our older ones, if you don't want to stay till the end, the very last minute of the meeting, we will give you a break and let you scoot out so that you don't have to stay till the end. Honorees, when you hear your award or name mentioned, come on up and stand with Dr. Tally up here in the front while we brag about you. And I'm, I know they're here because I recognize their jackets. Um, the South Carolina student, Future Farmers of America, soil, soil judging team winner from Peelian High School is made up 11, of 11th graders Thomas Corley, Savannah Pennington, and Bryson Shumpert. Y'all come on up. And 10th grader Michael Fields, who dug deep for a win in the recent South Carolina State Future Farmers of America Soil Judging Contest. And, and I think Dr. Little will tell you this is his very favorite outfit of all of our award winners. He covets your jackets, guys. So if you take it off for a little bit, you'll know where it went. It's in his office. The two-part competition includes classifying soils by their characteristics, surface texture, subsoil permeability, rooting depth, erosion, drainage, and slope, as well as land class and subclass. This in-depth knowledge competition earns the team points. The team then selects the appropriate recommended land treatments, which also earn them points. Tonight, their advisors are Frank Stover and Jesse Zeiser. Are they up here too? Come on, y'all come on up. And y'all, let's give all of these students a round of applause. Thank you guys. And if you ever get invited to a Future Farmers of America end of the year banquet, make sure you say yes, because it is a treat. That is just, they do these recitations and these kids just exhibit such leadership skills. We're really proud of our Future Farmers of America in Lexington One. Tonight, uh, WACH Fox and the Atkins Law Firm recognized White Knoll High School's Bria Singleton as their Scholar Athlete of the Week earlier this month. Is Bria here? Oh, imagine that. However, the first, well, here we go. However, the first round of basketball playoffs starts tonight in Somerville. She's not even in town, and she could not be here. This award makes Bria eligible to win a $2,500 scholarship. And let's see, here she is. Team captain for the Timberwolves basketball team, the senior guard, also a member of the National Honor Society and Beta Club, holds a 4.21 GPA. She plans to continue her education at the University of South Carolina, major in nursing, and eventually pursue a career as a physician assistant. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> We're going to wish her a lot of luck because that's a great scholarship to win. If Carolina Springs Middle School's principal Bryce Cockfield and school counselors Brandy Ludlam 
Amy Saunders and Anidra Wilson would come forward, please. I see Dr. Cockfield. Anybody else with you? You're on your own. Oh, I'm sorry. There you are. Carolina Springs Middle School's counseling program earned national recognition recently and is one of only 39 schools in 15 states this year to receive recognized American School Counselor Association Model Program or RAMP designation. The five-year-long RAMP designation presented by the American School Counselor Association is awarded to schools that align their counseling criteria to the association's national model and demonstrate a commitment to delivering a comprehensive data-informed school counseling program. The association will honor these school counselors during their annual conference this summer in Seattle, Washington. So that is quite the honor. Ms. Smith, mm -hmm. I got to um, attend a presentation for the RAMP uh, process back in the fall, and I was overwhelmed at how extensive and, I mean, the binder and the data and the analysis of the data, this is quite an achievement because there's a lot of work behind oh, it. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, will Lake Murray Elementary School Principal Jennifer Stanley come forward? I saw her out there. Common Sense, a national nonprofit dedicated to helping children and families thrive in a world of media and technology, recognized Lake Murray Elementary for its efforts to prepare students to use technology responsibly by naming it a Common Sense School. Lake Murray takes a whole community approach toward preparing students to think critically and to use technology responsibly to learn, create, and participate, all while warning them about cyberbullying, plagiarism, and privacy issues. Lake Murray uses Common Sense Education's research-based digital citizenship resources created in collaboration with researchers from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and grounded in the real issues students and teachers face. The resources teach students, educators, and parents tangible skills related to internet safety, protecting online reputations, and personal privacy, media literacy, and managing online relationships. Let's congratulate Lake Murray. Okay, now let's have Midway Elementary School Principal Jan Fickling. Is Ms. Fickling here? She's not here tonight. Assistant Principals Laquana Aldridge and Chris Bussell. Are they? There's Ms. Fickling. Okay. Teachers, and I know they're here because I saw them. Teachers and instructional assistants Gabby Adams, Dory Burmas, Emily Cox, Shelley, Shelley Cuthbertson, Kelly DeShazo, Caroline Heinrich, Samantha Lightsey, Laura Locklear, Andrea McLean, Sophia Cornelay, Kathy Pexanar, Dr. Katrinda Scott, Erin Willey, Maria Villa, Villa Labos, and, and Catherine Zahn, Zahl, Zahl, let's see, Zalm, come forward. And if I know if I butchered your names, please, please forgive me. Um, and if Instructional Services Divisions Amanda Haji and Dr. Liza Spies would join them, please. Midway Elementary School recently received international recognition of its French immersion program by earning the Label France. Let's, let me have y'all say it. One of you say it. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> they got that seal, and she did that beautifully. Thank you. The French Ministry of Foreign Affairs awards this accreditation established in 2012 to schools that promote the French language and culture. It gives Midway's immersion teachers access to authentic educational resources such as French books and lesson plans. Now I want you to hear this part because this is the really exciting part. Midway is the only school in South Carolina to receive this award and one of just five in the entire Southeast. So let's we're going to stand up for that. that. We were there for that, and that was such a fun day. And Midway, how many kids do y'all have in that program? It looked like about 300, three or 400. Yeah, I mean, it was just a sea of children, and they all spoke in French, sang in French, but more importantly, they knew what they were speaking and saying. 
So it's just a very impressive program, and y'all deserve these accolades. Huh? Let's give them a round, another round of applause. Human Resources, Kimberly Freeman, Employee Development Facilitator, and Devonna Price, the HR Director, recently earned a respected professional certification, Professional Human Capital Leaders in Education, by completing more than 60 hours of training and passing an extensive test by Battelle for Kids in partnership with the American Association of School Personnel Administrators. Two of only four professionals in South Carolina with this certification they mastered a set of education and human resources knowledge and skills designed to facilitate effective leadership and management in school, schools, districts, and other educational organizations. Congratulations on this wonderful accomplishment. <laughs> they report to Mr. Stacy, if you can't tell. <laughs> okay, the Mid-Atlantic Mid-Atlantic Athletic Trainers Association awarded, awards White Knoll High School Head Athletic Trainer and Assistant Athletic Director Sheila Gordon with its Most Distinguished Athletic Trainer Award. This prestigious honor recognized qualified members, leaders in their fields with at least 20 years of service for their exceptional contributions to the athletic training profession. She is also past president of the South Carolina Athletic Trainers Association. Let's recognize Ms. Gordon. I've actually seen her in action. We had a student fall out, I mean big time fall out, at a football game I was at. And I, Sheila was the first one on the scene. And buddy, I thought to myself, thank goodness for Sheila. <laughs> Lexington High School nurse Heather Jackson, if you would come forward, please. There she is. The South Carolina Department of Education named Nurse Jackson the Licensed Practical Nurse of the Year. She mentors newly hired licensed practical nurses and helps them foster relationships with their supervising registered nurse. All new LPNs shadow her for at least one day, learning from her effective procedures. She also leads the district's team morale group, which is made up of the system's 50 school nurses at 32 locations and works to improve the health and wellness of the staff as well. She facilitates wellness initiatives such as flu shot clinics, we might need you in a minute up here, mammograms and health screenings, and <laughs> we think you might have the other one though, and trains staff in emergency preparedness and student health procedures. Thank you, Nurse Jackson. The online giving platform DonorsChoose.org continues to support our educators' funding request. Our most recent educators with fully funded projects include Lexington High School's Ashley Miller and White Knoll Middle School's Candace Lett. Ashley Miller received funding for the Wildcat TV Need Your Help initiative to buy film production equipment such as tripods and SD cards needed to produce Wildcat TV. Broadcasting students at Lexington High School create segments on various current events and topics from sports to art and produce a daily show for the student body. Candace Lett, the literacy coach at White Knoll Middle, received funding to purchase young adult novels written by popular authors such as Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Rory Powers, and Veronica Roth. These books will serve as prizes for students who participate in an upcoming reading challenge hosted by the South Carolina Association of School Librarians. She also attended Y'all Fest, did I say that right? Y'all Fest, a young adult book event, and was able to get the authors to sign cards that will be given to the challenge winners along with their new books. That sounds like a Southern festival. So anyway, are they not here? But let's give them a round of applause. Okay, thank you for taking the time to help us recognize the many honors and achievements of our students and staff and the many contributions of our local businesses and community. We love sharing our good news. Honorees, when you leave the meeting, remember to head to your left and into the lobby where a member of the communications office will give you a certificate to help commemorate the night. Now, just as I promised, you, you are more than welcome to stay, but if you wanna do the backstroke and head home, <laughs> 
head on out in that rain, and maybe we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. You feeling any better? We're still sinking. Okay, while everyone is getting back in their seats, I'm going to go ahead and start reading. I'm going to go ahead and start reading the instructions for citizens participation because it's a lot. So, um, but they can everybody can be just making their way back to their seats and listening to the Lexington County. We're now to 9.0. The Lexington County School District 1 Board of Trustees provides a time for citizens' participation at each regular board meeting. There are a few guidelines, of course. First, in order to speak, you must be a parent or legal guardian of a student in Lexington County School District 1 or a resident and taxpayer of the district. Second, you will each have three minutes. Third, you may comment on an agenda item, school operations, programs, policies, or other matters of concerns. However, you may not speak about specific individuals, whether students or staff. There are other ways to bring situations like that to the board's attention. We want to give everyone who came here a chance to speak tonight. For that reason, board members will not reply to an individual's remarks. And if someone makes the point or points you came to make before you, if you would just state that you agree with the previous speakers and not restate every point, that would also help. We also ask you not to clap or make any comments either while an individual is speaking or after a speaker finishes as that slows down the process considerably. If you wanted to speak tonight, we ask that you fill out a card, that, uh, the card at the entrance, and we will include your name and address for our records. Those cards were on the sign-in table as you came to the meeting. If you have not filled out a card and still wish to speak, hold up your hand and we will provide you a card, th card at this time. Does anyone else want to speak that did not fill out a card? Okay, we will move on. As stated earlier, you should not expect us to reply to your remarks. Although we may ask you a question, as a board, we will not take any action tonight in response to issues you raised during citizens' participation. So tonight, we're gonna start with Ms. Tammy Reynolds. She is going to address the board regarding the immersion program. She lives at 540 Reedy O. Smith Road in Leesville, and she has a child that att attends Gilbert Primary. Ms. Reynolds? Good evening. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. I failed to mention that I also have a child at Gilbert Elementary, oh. so I have a first and a third grader in immersion. Okay. And I did submit some input as requested from mm -hmm. um, the district, and, and I attended both community meetings. And um, so it's a little bit concerning that I have to ask my questions about this prior to the issue being um, taken care of. But basically, I would like to request a meeting um, to further answer questions and concerns about the immersion being split between the two schools, specifically with my third grader. She will um, be in a class that's um, only one English and one Spanish versus my first grader who has two Spanish and two English classes. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was gonna be addressed, that there's a lot of concern out there. And I certainly share that. And I wanted to make sure there's gonna be a forum where we can have those things addressed. Thank you. I'm now going 
Excuse me. I'm now going to follow up with Mr. John Reynolds. He wants to follow up to the community meetings regarding, I, I think, the drawing of the lines for in Gilbert. He lives at 540 Reedy O. Smith Road in Leesville, and he has children at Gilbert Primary and Gilbert Elementary. Mr. Reynolds? Yes, I wanted to ask the same questions as far, not as what my wife just asked, but my question was, which I attended both meetings also, my biggest concern was about the white pieces of paper that we were given, fill these out, fill these out, fill these out. I want to know if those issues were talked about, mm -hmm. if those issues were addressed, what the outcome is. I know that there's no Q&A here, and that's fine. I intend on attending the next or the third and final reading. My biggest concern is that as a community, and we've been in the Gilbert for about 15 years now, I want to make sure as a citizen of the town of Gilbert that these issues are at least going to be talked about. I'm not saying that I need to have a final one way or the other, but I think because I've done my due diligence by coming, being a presence, talking to y'all, I think that I deserve the same respect by these papers. These papers, these, that's all we were told when we were at that meeting. These papers, these papers, these papers. Well, I want information about the papers. We filled out papers, what our concern was, what our issues were. We get, there's change. We embrace the change. We have to drive back past all four schools to go to Centerville because right now that's where we are located to do that. That's fine. It's no big deal. You got to do what you got to do. Um, my other concern is that the I wanted to know and ask about the numbers of the class sizes. Mm -hmm. That was something that very much interests me. As my wife stated, we have two children in the immersion program. I want to make sure that the district is committing to me as a parent of these emerging kids as I committed to this four years ago. Right now, I don't see that commitment from the district because of the change and some of the things, but it may be, but I don't know because I don't know what's been addressed or hasn't been addressed. So that's my biggest concern here, and that's why I'm here Okay. as a concerned parent. Well, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Anything but else? But also, at the, the thing that concerns me, and this is more or less me as a father, that we open this meeting with a word of prayer, but yet we can't do that in our school system. And to me, I think it's a sad, sad day that you took the Lord out of the school system. Whether that's law or not, I'm not sure how that, you know, I don't know. But just wanted to make that comment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. And you are just in time. The next item on the agenda, 10.0, is the second reading. We will be discussing the Centerville um, Elementary Zoning Plan, and it will be discussed in here. Um, I don't know how much you know about the school board, but we are not allowed to discuss these things in private. We can only discuss them in this setting. So uh, everything that you hear tonight is our, our, those are our discussions. We'll be hearing a presentation. I wanted to let you know, too, that all of the information that we have been given by the community members, the parents, the teachers, um, I believe has been shared. Ms. Hill, what's the last date that was shared with us? I think we all got the Monday through the most recent that you had received online and, and the papers from the meetings, correct? And so all the board members have received those as of, as of what was current through last Monday. So we did receive your comments. So at this time, we're going to go to second reading for Centerville Elementary Zoning Plan. Board, this is for information only. We will not be voting on this tonight. We'll, we will be voting next month on this. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Salters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there we go. Um, we uh, <coughs> we talking about second reading of the Centerville attendance lines uh, this evening. Um, and just to recap, we had first reading last month, and then we have since had two community meetings, as uh, has previously been discussed, uh, where we received input at Gilbert Elementary School um, and uh, Gilbert Primary School. Um, and Ms. Sill just gave me a kind of a, a number here that we received like 49 uh, pieces of feedback from those meetings. Um, obviously, that information was um, assimilated and um, referred to, to the school board uh, for input and um, discussion and uh, the senior leadership team and, and members of the staff at Central Services 
uh, has had much discussion uh, regarding that feedback uh, since those uh, meetings occurred. And so tonight we're looking at um, second reading. Um, and just to remind you, um, you know, our considerations when we're looking at doing uh, a rezoning effort is we're trying to use our facilities as efficiently as possible, uh, minimizing subdivisions, um, you know, balancing student demographics where possible, allowing future student growth in our permanent facilities. Um, we do look at transportation patterns for efficient and safe student transportation. And we uh, try to use natural and major road boundaries where possible uh, so that the lines are easily identifiable um, in the community. And so um, second reading, um, this is a rendering of, of Centerville Elementary. You'll actually see some uh, pictures later on in the meeting of the construction progress. Um, we, we looked at the themes um, that were um, pulled together in this, um, in this uh, group of feedback and we, we came up with three major themes. Um, one was travel concerns, um, another was daycare concerns, and then uh, the last uh, major theme was immersion program considerations. And so uh, obviously there were a few, you know, um, other ideas than, and concepts that were, that were brought forward, but these were the most common uh, themes that were um, addressed in the feedback. And so I just want to take a uh, little bit deeper look at, at these. Um, so just to remind you um, kind of what we're talking about, you know, this, this entire area is the current um, Gilbert Elementary, Gilbert Primary attendance zone, uh, which is a, a third of our school district. Uh, so it's a tremendously large area um, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, the size of, of uh, what we're trying to work with here. Um, and I've showed this, this slide before, but um, in the lower area here uh, of the um, the proposed new Centerville zone, you're about eight and a half or 8.8 .8 miles from Centerville, uh, about four miles on this side, actually about 9.7 uh, from the, the top side up here. Um, and then in Gilbert Elementary, the further distances are 12 and a half miles and about 10.6 miles in, in this area here. Uh, <clears throat> and so one of the areas of, of feedback that we received uh, mostly uh, w with concerns with travel distance was really right in this area right here. Uh, and I'll just kind of zoom in on that. Um, there are about 68 students um, in, in this area. This is Perry Taylor Road for your reference uh, here. Um, and so 68 students in this area. And so, you know, the consideration was uh, the thought of maybe moving that line, um, you know, north of, of Perry Taylor or using Perry Taylor as, as the line. Uh, and you can see the difficulty in, in doing that when you take 68 students from um, Centerville and put them back at Gilbert Elementary School. Um, you, you put Gilbert Elementary School um, basically at almost over capacity, and then Centerville would be underutilized at that point. So um, that's one of the, the, the concerns that, that we're, we're dealing with there. And so um, one of the recommending recommendations that we're proposing this evening to try to address some of, of that concern, uh, because understand that there are a number of folks in this area, um, you know, that are, are pleased with the lines. Um, and, you know, we had some feedback from folks here that are, you know, pleased with, with um, going to Centerville. <clears throat> so what our recommendation right now is um, assuming that the lines uh, remain as they are drawn, um, we would recommend that student services be able to um, employ 10 school choice slots uh, for each school uh, to allow for uh, folks in this area um, the potential to choice into um, Gilbert Elementary School should they choose to do that. Um, <clears throat> and that would require they provide transportation um, to Gilbert Elementary. Across the district when we do school choice, um, those slots are, are not uh, picked up by buses, they're required. Uh, to have uh, their own transportation. And if we have more than 10, how do you handle that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, student services uh, conducts a, a lottery, uh, which is handled in accordance with board policy. Uh, there's actually a school choice policy um, that describes that. And so um, uh, they would conduct a lottery uh, to um, apply those slots. So that's our recommendation, assuming the lines would, would stay as, as they are uh, recommended in second reading. 
uh, to address the, you know, the feedback of travel concerns in that area. Because as we said, you know, not all 68 students in that area um, had travel concerns. Uh, and so uh, we felt like that would uh, be a help to meet, meet that need. <clears throat> Looking at daycare concerns, um, one of the, the, the biggest concern that we heard um, really came out of, uh, there were a couple of individual situations, but um, generally speaking, the, the bigger concerns were um, there are two daycares um, located on Broad Street, and they are um, Learn to Grow and the Leisure Center, and they're on the Gilbert Elementary School side of Broad Street. Um, and uh, so the concern was that students attending Centerville Elementary uh, would not have the ability to uh, have transportation um, to those two um, daycare facilities. And so, um, you know, one thing to, to remind folks is that uh, Centerville will be working on a, an after school program. Um, and so that obviously is one option. But secondary to that, assuming that the lines were to stay as they're drawn here, um, we would be bringing a bus down um, Broad Street from Centerville. Um, and because it's on that street already, uh, we, would, we would be able to drop students at Learn to Grow and uh, Leisure Center from Centerville. Uh, so to, to alleviate that, um, that transportation concern for those two um, facilities. So that's, um, that's our recommendation. <clears throat> um, and so we, we would you know, consider serving all the daycares on Broad Street, regardless of school lines, if, if the lines were to remain as, as they're drawn. So um, really trying to get to that feedback about, about that daycare concern as well. Mr. Salters, I think there was a concern about the Big Blue Marble. I think that's the name of it, daycare. And I think you talked with the director. Well, so Big Blue Marble, um, from from our understanding and, and you know feedback that we've gotten, has actually two locations. Um, one location, whoops, one location is located here, um, right right down the street from um, Gilbert Elementary School, and the other location is actually up in the um, Centerville attendance zone actually right down the street from Centerville Elementary School. So they actually have two locations that are um, close to, to the facilities. Um, so it appears that those two um, locations will work out just fine. And so um, immersion considerations, um, you know, one of the things that we, we looked at um, in, in conversations and feedback that we got was to have all of the immersion programs at one school. Um, and so um, that's, that's something that we looked at um, and did some analysis on. Um, and when you bring in, one thing you have to remember is we're dealing essentially with two schools worth of immersion students um, because you have a third of the district, right? Um, and you currently are operating two schools. They're just combined grade spans. And so those facilities were set up and designed, you know, that primary school we added kindergarten classrooms to, uh, to handle it as a primary school. And so a typical elementary school doesn't have, you know, the, the size and scope of those uh, classrooms. So you, you run into some, some space limitations, um, you know, if you house everything at, at Centerville with the type of classrooms that you might need um, to, to um, operate that, that facility. Um, and then you also get into a situation um, in, in the district historically when we have done a rezoning effort, um, when we've had an immersion program at a school and rezoned, um, we have not provided transportation for anyone who's out of zone that now attends that school. Um, we, we just don't have the busing facilities to be able to drive out of zone and pick up students. So theoretically, if you housed it at Gilbert Elementary School, as an example, um, all of the Centerville students would have to provide their own transportation. Um, and vice versa, if you house it at Centerville, all the Gilbert Elementary students would have to provide their own transportation. And so we did some analysis on um, the busing situation and who, who of these students rides the bus. Uh, there are a considerable number of students that participate in immersion that ride the bus um, more after school than before. Um, but, but on both ends of the equation, there are, are bus riders involved, and so we would be restricting uh, their access potentially to the program. And so another uh, theme that came out uh, was could we look at grandfathering certain grade levels um, and um, housing, you know, say grades three through five at 
um, I'll just say Centerville Elementary School, for example, <clears throat> and then have K-2 programs at each, each school. Um, and so as we started looking into that and trying to um, manipulate and move kids to where they would need to be, um, it, it became very problematic because you ended up having um, elementary students split between two campuses. Um, you know, I, my, my brother is going, is in third grade, so they've got to go to Centerville. I'm a kindergartner, so I've got to go to Gilbert Elementary School. Um, and so you're starting to split siblings and it became, it became very problematic to uh, try to work that out. Um, and so that really hasn't been a, a, an idea that um, we feel is really viable. Another thought was to, to operate some uh, form of shuttles uh, between the schools. Um, and, and so uh, the idea there was if you were going to attend Centerville, <clears throat> maybe you could get to Gilbert Elementary School on a bus, and then the bus would take you to Centerville um, or vice versa. The challenge with the shuttle system um, uh, is, number one, the time that it takes to um, ride that bus is lost instruction time. So if I ride a bus and I arrive at Gilbert Elementary School and then I'm shuttled to Centerville, you know, that 15 minutes in the morning, uh, I've lost instruction. Same thing in the afternoon because I've got to get back, catch my afternoon bus. Uh, reality is, you know, you could lose 30 to 45 minutes a day of instruction just in transportation back and forth. Um, and, and so that, that time is too precious uh, to our, our elementary folks and, and we didn't feel like that was a, a really practical approach. Um, either. <clears throat> so um, at, at this point, uh, after considering everything that we're looking at, the recommendations that we um, are putting out is, is, again, full immersion programs at both Gilbert Elementary and Centerville. Um, you'll have smaller class sizes uh, for a few years at each location, um, but I think ultimately the smaller class sizes are what everyone is looking for. Um, Mr. Salters and Dr. Talley, you may jump in. I know Mr. Reynolds had a question about class sizes. Do you have like a general idea of numbers that we're talking about to help answer his question? Well, if, if I can say, so part of the challenge there obviously is where the lines end, where, up. Where the lines end up, right? So, um, but if you just kind of look at it at the moment, the class sizes would be smaller, especially in those upper grades. Um, now you still don't exactly know, uh, well, and he'll get through like the immersion students who live outside of Gilbert and some of those types of things, but the, the class sizes in third, fourth, and fifth grade, especially fourth and fifth grade would be smaller, uh, because you're talking, you're, you're cutting a, you're cutting that pie down one more, uh, but for, it's also for the, next couple but for the next couple of years, but they'll grow into that. And I think when we were having the conversation, we said, well, we would rather have, instead of people have to choose between transportation and education, we would rather provide the education in both places um, and make sure that um, that everybody had the opportunity to do it and that you didn't have to, well, I ride the bus in the afternoon so I can't participate, or I ride the bus in the morning and I can't participate some, for, some, for whatever reason. Um, and also keeping in mind the logistical challenge of breaking up 125 square miles um, and then trying to offer one location in terms of immersion. And I, and I don't know, as, as we tried to brainstorm that entire experience, it was very difficult to try and think of a solution that would capture all of those factors, except for this one. You know, and, and additionally, um, with the class size is one of the things that we've, we've spoken with the principals about and, and something that, that they're um, actually doing now and, and will continue to do is, is a two-way immersion experience. <clears throat> and, and that's where students uh, w that are native speaking um, are actually tested and, and could potentially be placed into those upper grade levels, assuming they pass you know, a, a regular standard of test. They're not just going to put them in there because um, they, they speak the native language. They have to um, meet certain standards and, and be able to keep up in the class. And so if they are, they, they are able to be added to, to the class and offer that um, additional support and benefit for really speakers of both languages in that scenario. So there are opportunities to add students to those classes as we as we go forward. And as Dr. Little mentioned, um, this scenario does provide transportation for all students. Um, and so the, that, that takes away that limitation um, for access to the program. Um, and then currently immersion students who live outside of the Gilbert attendance area, so the current um, Gilbert elementary and primary area, 
um, will either be placed at Gilbert Elementary or Centerville based on the grade level enrollments um, as, as those um, develop. Um, and so um, taking on this, this approach again, we're, we're looking at the projected enrollment being you know, 705 and, and 816. Now you add 10 choice slots to each of these and those numbers could grow because um, board, as you're aware, when, when you choice, it's a family choice. And so if you know, a fifth grader uh, gets that slot and they have two siblings, that's actually three students. Um, and those other students continue that choice on through the family legacy as well. So um, those numbers could grow by 15 or 20, um, you know, just as a result of choice um, and uh, approving that recommendation. So but that's a ballpark uh, enrollment number there. And, and again, we're, we're looking at the lines um, that, we, that we've presented. Um, we, we didn't have any real um, compelling feedback at this point to, to, to shift anything. Um, you know, we, on Wire Road to Louie, to Broad Street, to Green Hills Drive, to Kraut Pond, um, and then on over to um, AC Balk Night, Camp Branch, and Two Notch. Um, and again, trying to address some of that feedback in this area through choice, uh, because you know we had a number of folks who were who were very interested and pleased who live in this area with the lines, as well as um, folks who were you know who were concerned and wanted to to stay where they were. So um, we, uh, as mentioned, immersion would be offered at both schools. The three and four year old programs would be offered at um, Gilbert Elementary School, 4K uh, at Centerville. Um, and no grandfathering at this time. Um, and then three and four year olds ultimately would end up moving to, uh, in that Gilbert Tennessee area, would move to an early childhood center um, in the future as that space is developed and repurposed at the current Gilbert Elementary School location. Key dates, just call your attention to these um, as we've gone through. Just remember that, um, you know, we've had these meetings, public hearings, and then uh, second reading is tonight. Third reading will be. Um, at the um, March meeting. And of course, between now and March, um, we will continue to receive feedback. Um, and hopefully tonight's discussion will have um, spawned some other ideas and thoughts um, and we'll receive additional feedback for consideration. And we will continue to monitor that feedback um, and, and come up with ideas and suggestions and make, make adjustments um, and look for your feedback as well uh, for consideration uh, before a third reading. Um, in March. And so with that, I'll answer any questions you have as a board. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Mr. Salters, are there any questions or comments for Mr. Salters or Dr. Talley? And I understand uh, Mr. Branham and I think Ms. Mr. Moody are here too as well. They're, they're welcome to join in if anybody has any questions or comments. I have a few comments. I think more so than class size, these students that are in third, fourth, well, will be third, fourth, fifth next year. They want those students to stay together, the parents do. And we've gotten a couple of emails from <laughs> teachers, one which was very, um, she put a lot of work into this proposal. Um, has the senior leadership team had a chance to look at the proposal that the board got from a teacher this morning? Yeah, so we talked about that today. One of the critical pieces of that particular plan was the shuttle bus. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really fleshed out that as an issue. And um, again, from the shuttle bus perspective, if you're, say for example, you would put the immersion program at Centerville Elementary School, the shuttle bus would have to come to Gilbert after everybody's run the routes and then go from Gilbert back. And then in the afternoon, they would have to leave early so the folks at Gilbert Elementary School could catch their buses home. So that loss of instructional time is, uh, is really what we prioritized when we started talking about the shuttle buses. Okay, I'd be interested in seeing how many students would be on these buses. I know I talked about this during the first um, rezoning we went through last year. I think there needs to be an additional meeting between second reading and third reading with the stakeholders because we get feedback, but then as a board, this is what we have to discuss is on the night of the meeting and we're presented the lines and we really don't have to, time to discuss what's went on between first and second reading. And then when third reading shows up, we don't have time to discuss that with the stakeholders. In other districts, I've noticed, I would like to see this, I mentioned this during our last rezoning as well, I would like to see us put together a committee, um, a couple of the teachers that emailed us, some bus drivers, the principals, um, some staff, 
to talk about how we can make this work because they've made very good points about why the immersion students that are currently together should be grandfathered in. Okay. I mean, as a committee, that would be the board's responsibility. Is that something that the board could put together? Would be some kind of ad hoc committee between now and third reading? Um, we'd have to talk about it. I, I'm not sure that the board would. I, I think the method we have now, we've had two community meetings where people were given information, allowed to ask questions. They've also been able to communicate with us. They can, they've submitted responses. They can call us. They can email us. They can ask to meet with us in person. Um, as you know, it is against the law for us to have more than three people at a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't just call an ad hoc meeting. This is the best forum for this. That's what we're doing tonight. That's why we allowed them to talk, and they will have another opportunity to address us before the next meeting, and they'll have plenty of time. If they want to call us individually, write us letters, email us, um, it's just we're so constrained by the laws that govern this board. That's why the committee would not have board members on it. It would just be members well, of the community. I think Mr. Branham and Mr. Moody, I think you have met with your teachers. I know you've met with Dr. Speaks. I know you've met with Dr. Talley. Um, I know you've had extensive conversations in your own schools and with your parents. So. But we aren't, as a board, like the two parents who came up here tonight and spoke to us, like we can't respond to them. And like the man said, when are y'all going to answer all these questions? I mean, and that's a good question. These people have very good questions, like when are they going to get answers? Well, I think a lot of the questions were answered tonight. I don't think so, looking back okay. at some of these questions in here. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Garris. Any other comments or questions, board? So as a parent who's never, I've always been jealous of the immersion schools because we've, you know, we've just never been zoned for one. Would splitting the immersion programs to, to the two schools create more capacity for us as a district? Um, because, you know, when I think about our district, district, it's the academic rigor, and then it's our, our world language focus and our arts focus. I think that, you know, it's why people move. So would this create, so I'm, I'm thinking at the 10,000 foot view for the Gilbert community, would this ultimately long term, because it's going to cost us more money, I'm sure, but give us more capacity for students to, to be bilingual? Sure. When we look at the projected numbers, um, Dr. Powers and, and others, um, in our earlier grades, we were already seeing the numbers larger than, in, as Dr. Little mentioned, third, fourth, and fifth grade. And as already has been mentioned, we feel like those smaller numbers at those uh, upper grades will be temporary, and the district's willing to commit to providing the support we need for those smaller classes right now because we do feel like uh, the program is, as you know, an exemplary program, and we feel like that in the Gilbert community, we're gonna only grow that program in both those schools and offer great uh, instruction to both sites. And that was the, uh, when, when I met with the two principals, that was certainly their desire. They both wanted immersion in their buildings. And isn't Spanish our most requested um, immersion language? It is. And it's the easiest language, as Mr. Stacy will tell you, to recruit teachers. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Guyton? Yeah, so uh, one question, one comment. First question, with regard to the, the busing from Centerville to the, the other daycares, are there financial implications uh, to the district involving that? And, and if so, is that kind of an ongoing? How does that look? Well, if we... The further you drive into a zone that, that the bus is not zoned for, so if Centerville bus went into the um, the Gilbert Elementary zone, then there's financial implications as far as the payment to the driver and, and the reimbursement to the state for the mileage. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with having to pay um, what is equivalent to a hazardous stop because it's a stop that's not you know approved by the State Department uh, by the State Department of Transportation. With this, with being on uh, Broad Street, so while we may have a, a stop that we would have to pay for, a Centerville bus would stop on Broad Street and deliver students to a, a Gilbert address, we wouldn't have the, the implications of probably having to pay for the driver's time and, and pay extra mileage because it would be a part of the route. So to answer your question, there is some financial implications um, and over the course of the year, depending on the number of buses that it would take to do this. Uh, could, could accumulate into a few thousand dollars. I don't have an exact figure. But essentially, it's you're saying it's, for the most part, mitigated by the fact of where the location of the line is by That's simply right. being on Broad Street. That's right. And having Gilbert on one side, Centerville on the other, it helps to mitigate those costs. That's exactly right, because the bus is not having to go and drive into a 
the out of zone area. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I guess comment wise, I think of, of the three themes, um, and, and I would completely echo everything that, that you put up there regarding the, the three concerns that we have gotten feedback on travel, daycare, and immersion. Probably the most prevalent theme I have seen there um, has been the immersion. Um, I get, well, I guess I do have a question. When families sign up, elect for their child to go into immersion, what's the sort of the philosophical, how do we approach that philosophically? How do, how do we approach that in terms of the cohort, the, the students, the relationships? Because I heard a lot about relationships and these children together, these children together. My children have never been in an immersion program, so I, I, we, we have never had that experience. But I'm just curious, what what's the philosophy that, that we instill there? Sure. <laughs> well, as you know, I am an immersion parent, um, fourth grader at Pleasant Hill Elementary School. But what I'd like to do is we have Dr. Liza Spies here today, um, and I'm going to surprise her just a second. If we could get her, if uh, somebody could get her a microphone because I'd like for her to talk about that particular piece of it as we approach that philosophically. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for um, giving me the chance to speak. So uh, the philosophical piece that you asked about in terms of our commitment to the classes and the cohort has to do with academic rigor and the, the experience that we're gonna provide for our students is one that is going to help them become bilingual and biliterate and also um, do very well in their content area subjects that they're learning. There's no particular, um, the purpose of the program isn't to build, um, isn't specifically to build strong relationships between the kids and the class. The kids do move, that's a byproduct that comes out of it that many families really appreciate and some families, you know, kind of would like more intermingling with other students. And so it's sort of a mixed bag in that um, capacity. But what we do find is that we are um, constantly switching kids. So while there are two homerooms, typically in each school, that are immersion, students can switch from one homeroom to another or from one homeroom back to the other homeroom, depending on the year. And so it's not, um, it is possible that students could be in a different homeroom than other kids in immersion. So um, philosophically, our goal is to provide a very strong bilingualism and biliteracy for the kids and we're doing that and I believe that moving to two schools as um, Dr. Power said would provide greater capacity for the Gilbert area and provide more opportunities for immersion for even some of the slightly underserved areas and I think it would be a, a very strong benefit for the Gilbert community to have immersion in both locations. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I, I guess so, so. What you're saying, you know, based off of the 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 philosophy of the academic rigor, what comes out of that is sort of the natural outpouring of the relationships that develop. Exactly, um, that comes out of the fact that there's only the two groups. Sure. So typically, there's only two home rooms, and so there's only two spaces they could move back and forth to. So that's not necessarily the intention or the purpose behind immersion. That just right. happens as a right. result. Right. Yes. And, and I guess that's, therein lies the rub, um, because that's, that's the piece that we're getting feedback on, is the relationship aspect. That's what we're hearing, is, you know, that, um, uh, that there's a, a consistent uh, kind of band, if you will, um, uh, among these students. And, and I get it, trust me. Um, and, and I guess, I'm not convinced we have the answer at this point. Um, I think this is a, a temporary issue, if you will, because we're we're looking at a um, a group of students who, for an upcoming K through two, it's less of an issue than a three through five. Um, is kind of what I'm learning in this. Um, so I I'm not convinced we have the answer. I, I think the answers are there, somewhere in there, um, maybe a blended mix. Um, but I, I guess if I had a piece of feedback regarding specific to immersion is. It seems like it's a problem that still needs to be worked, would be my, my feedback. 
So how do you think is a good way to work on that? No clue. But I tell you, the, the email we got was, was fantastic. I, I always enjoy reading a, an email where not only do you present a problem, but you present a proposed solution. That's, that's the best way to attack any issue. Is, is to not only offer up the problem, but to offer up a, a potential solution. Um, the solution that, and this was just one that was emailed to us, but you know, it, it seems to be a blend of all three of those um, outside of the um, all at one school location. I think the one consistent is that, you know, definitely at two schools, but how is that, you know, is there a, a, a mechanism for divide? Um, and that's the, the hard part. Um, I, I can't say I have the solution right now. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not smart enough to figure it out. I can tell you that. Um, but uh, I, I still think it could be worked a little bit. I agree. And, and that's what I'm saying is the people that we're hearing from, they have solutions and they're in the schools and they know how this works best. Like getting them all together and talking about it and getting some answers for these people that have sent in feedback um, that's why I think we need another community meeting or some kind of ad hoc committee. Thank you, Ms. Garris. Any other questions or comments for it? Yes. Well, and sir. I would just are, like to add. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry. I was going to say, sir, are we going to plan any of this? Because I know you said the board needs to talk about it, but this is our talking time between now and third reading. Well, and, and Ms. Garrison, and I, um, I had actually written down earlier um, during citizens' participation, we need to have a Gilbert community meeting because I think we do need to talk about this again or let the community talk again with perhaps Dr. Little and Mr. Salters. Um, one point I would make, and I th think we haven't talked about that, is um, especially for these older students, third, fourth, and fifth grade, my youngest is a ninth grader now. Um, third, fourth, and fifth grade goes by like that, and these students are all gonna be back together in sixth grade. Um, I did not have an immersion student. Um, my children experienced, you know, I think they probably had 10 or 11 different um, third, grade, third grade classes at Midway. And so every year they had a new best friend. Um, and I think that that's something that is valuable for children to learn, that social um, nimbleness and getting along with others. Um, I think it's something that the parents should model a little more maybe. Um, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind when we talk about um, I think we've got some really great suggestions and some ideas, very well thought out. I love the chart um, because I'm a very visual thinker. Um, I do understand the importance of preserving instructional time. And as a board, our job is to consider what's best for all students. Parents, your job is to consider what's best for your student. And so somewhere we have to find where the middle ground is on that. Um, and so I think maybe more discussion. Um, I don't know that necessarily a, another committee is the right way to go about it, um, but I think I, I have no doubt um, that Dr. Little and Mr. Salters and Dr. Talley and Mr. Branham and Mr. Moody are gonna continue to talk to the parents and the stakeholders, and they have kept us very well informed on the feedback that, what, that they have received over the last month, um, and I have no doubt that we will continue to get that feedback. So I really like to just suggest that we let the process continue the way it is supposed to continue um, and see where we are in a couple weeks, um, and hopefully maybe, you know, to Dr. Guyton's point, maybe a little bit more clear picture of how the, the best way forward is on this. But I think we need to um, let the process continue to work the I way it's supposed the, to work. I think the introduction of the 10 choice slots may uh, help with a little bit of that too, the angst of the parents. Okay. Okay, anything else board? We'll move on. We're now gonna go to 11.0 and board, we're getting ready to take several votes here. So we're going into our action section. 11.1 .1 is the second reading of our vaping resolution. If, and if you were with us last month, Dr. Guyton introduced a vaping resolution. Um, it was excellent. And um, we've all had a chance to review it. And tonight, do I hear a motion regarding the vaping resolution as presented by Dr. Guyton and Dr. Little? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the vaping resolution as presented by Dr. Guyton and the administration. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. 
Thank you, Dr. Powers. Board, are there any questions or comments regarding the vaping resolution as presented? Yes, there was a correction from last time, and we took out e-cigarettes and put in electronic nicotine delivery systems, but not all vapes or jewels, whatever you call them, have nicotine. So I'm wondering, I'm sure y'all thought this out. Um, Ms. Garris, I actually, um, I sent a copy of the first draft to um, the folks at Laredac, and they reviewed it just to make sure that it's consistent with um, how they um, provide the education and resources that they do. And that was the one suggestion that they sent back was to change it to nicotine delivery systems. Um, Dr. Guyton might be able to answer the question about with Nick, because I had the same thought with, it says nicotine and there's not nicotine in some of these products. So you might be able to answer yeah, that. Yeah, you know, so all the literature that you, you run across uh, uses the acronym ENDS, ENDS. Um, and that's pretty much a universal type um, designation for any type of vaping device. Um, I think the intention, the, the word nicotine, I think is meant to be more the intention of the device before it is actually altered um, after, after manufacture. Um, and so while yes, certainly the devices can um, administer THC or you know, whatever other drug of choice may be out there, um, the intention uh, is that the, they're manufactured with nicotine in mind. So I think that's what is the real driver for the ENDS acronym, if you will. Um, and yeah, just, you know, uh, I think this, this kind of played out beautifully um, when um, uh, uh, Dr. M with um, uh, LOCC reached out and basically offered up this advice. It, it really kind of shows that um, there is sort of a, a, a universal um, uh, desire to, to see this improve. Um, and, and I think moreover, um, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing a tipping point. Uh, we, we are starting to see a tipping point. We're seeing um, some of the largest manufacturers really starting to struggle these days. Um, if you can imagine $38 billion company struggling. Um, it, it, we are seeing it. We're seeing legislation on the state level. We're seeing legislation on the national level. Um, we're seeing, you know, multiple CDC, um, other medical agencies getting involved. We're actually seeing school uh, districts suing um, uh, these um, uh, these companies. I'm not suggesting that by any stretch, but um, it, it's getting a lot of press these days. And so I, I think we're we're in the right. Um, we're heading in the right direction. It's just a long road to, to drive. And not to throw a wet blanket on Dr. Guyton's comment, but I did send him and a, a couple others. Um, yesterday, NPR um, published an article um, about vaping and how um, like Juul, which is kind of, you know, a brand, but we kind of use that as a generic term, that that is like very yesterday, that there are already new products that teenagers are using, um, new devices, um, that it's just one of those things that we're just going to constantly be uh, play catch up on. Um, and so I think anything that we can do to be proactive to at least come down on our philosophy on it, I think is a, a step in the right direction. And I think too, you have to remember if they, and I might need some help here, Mr. Caldwell, but if they are putting illicit drugs in a device like THC or whatever, that's a whole nother, that's a law, that's different laws, that's different policies where they're um, abusing illicit right. drugs. It, it, at that point, it becomes a violation of the drug and alcohol policy. Right. Okay. Now, and, as with, you know, any resolution or any policy we adopt, um, uh, we want to see measurable gain. I think at the end of the day, and th that'll be the telltale, um, is, is what type of measurable gain do we see. So um, hopefully when we, we go and look at, at the points at which we have, have made changes, hopefully from that we will see improvement. Um, time will, will basically tell. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guyton. Anybody else? Questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. We have a motion and a second in the, on the floor. All in favor of the vaping resolution as submitted by Dr. Guyton and Dr. Little, please say aye. Uh, um, any nays? The motion carries and it is unanimous. We will now, we'll now have second reading of the policy. It has not been de determined yet for the, the numbers for the employee use of animals in schools. Um, and so 
this one, we're going to read each of these separately, although really a lot of these policies are kind of interrelated. We're going to start with the employee use of animals in schools, then we're going to move to the student use of animals in school, then we're going to go to the visitor's use of animals in schools. And so we will start with the um, employee use of animals in schools. Board, you were given this policy at our last meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve this policy with the codification to be determined at a later date? for employee use of animals in schools. Do I have a motion? Y'all come on, <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move that the uh, board adopt the uh, policy to be determined employee use of animals in schools. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding this policy? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the policy which will the codification will be determined, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. We now have second reading for the policy with the codification to be determined for student use of animals in schools. Do I hear a motion to approve policy stu for student use of animals in schools? It's not codified yet. Madam Chair, I move the board accept the policy to be determined student use of animals in schools. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding the student use of animals in schools? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. We will now go to the policy to be determined for visitor use of animals in schools. Do I hear a motion to approve policy? for the visitor use of animals in schools with the codification to be determined at a later date. Madam Chair, move the board accept the policy to be determined visitor use of animals in schools. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments, board? Sounds like we're gonna have a lot of animals at our schools. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a service horse that somebody took a service pony on a plane this week. I and saw I was, that picture too. It took up like the, all the leg room. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> Um, anyway, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> the motion carries and it is unanimous. Um, we will now go to second reading of policy GBEB, which is employee conduct. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve policy GBEB regarding employee conduct? Madam Chair, I move the board accept policy GBEB employee conduct. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Okay, board, I will now open this up for uh, discussion. Are there any questions or comments regarding this policy? I have a couple of comments. Um, last month, I brought up a section about the social media part, and this still concerns me. Um, no other district's policy that I reviewed includes such restrictive language as ours does. I like the school board association model language that says the personal life of an employee, including their use of social media, email, and texting, is a concern only when it disrupts the educational environment. Um, in this policy, I find it odd that we are removing paragraphs related to the arrest of an employee and summing it up in a couple of sentences. Um, it sounds like we care more about someone liking a social media post than we do if an employee gets arrested. Um, I'm just wondering, does anyone have any objections to using the School Board Association model language in paragraph five? And that would be the last couple of sentences that have black lines through them. Mr. Stacy, do you want to walk us through the work you've done for the last month? As far as the social media piece, we have reviewed it with the attorney, um, and that really is their verbiage with regards to social media. Um, Ms. Garris, you did ask about, you know, like how prevalent is this concern with us. I did a little bit of research. We probably average about two times per month that we talk to employees with regards to social media. Um, our thinking here is that the more we put in the policy as it relates to the use of social media, the more upfront we are with employees. Um, we only deal with social media when it becomes a disruption. And by disruption, I'm saying that somebody has called our office and made a concern, declared a concern, a complaint with regard to some type of post. I don't troll Facebook um, or any other social media. I, you know, I, I don't, unless somebody brings it to my attention, 
I don't know anything about it. And so when it's brought to our attention, that's a disruption. And what we want to do is do that at the lowest possible level. And typically, when we say two plus per month, typically that's a conversation with an employee saying, you know, you might want to consider removing this particular post. Um, you might want to consider rethinking, you know, that, putting that on social media. And I would say the majority of the time, most of the time, almost all of the time, that's all it takes is just that conversation and that limits it. Um, we did have with um, the new employee induction this past year, Palmetto Teachers Association came out, their attorneys, and did a session with our new teachers. They address social media with our new teachers because they are getting more and more complaints with regards to to teachers, and especially kids coming out of college. They've put stuff on their Facebook when they were in college that probably they don't need to share with the general public because they're in public education. So I really think that the point here is to try so hard to put things in front of people. It's hard to have those conversations when it's really bad and, and the consequence is so severe. We just want to get in front of it as much as possible and, and just have those conversations at a much lower level and just be done with it. So, so I appreciate, I do appreciate your concern, but we did, I did, we did look at it and talk back and forth with it. I understand. I'm just saying, I think the school board association, what they have in the model policy sums it up. Um, unless it pre prevents them from effectively performing his or her job duties and disrupts the educational environment, um, there's not much to worry about. We don't need to go in detail about how social media has the potential to result in disruption. Um, it can be a violation of board policy. The board expects district staff to ensure all communications associated with social media accounts are consistent with their role. Um, I just think as a board, we're just afraid of, you know, what people might say on social media. That's why part of the board has agreed not to post or reply on social media. You know, and as I told you, this is kind of a board decision. So. I'm just wondering, does anyone up here have any objections to using the model language in paragraph five and taking out the section in here that's been put in by Lexington one? Would you like to submit that as an amendment, Ms. Garris? Yes. Okay, so please submit that as okay. an amendment. I move to amend the current policy in paragraph five that we remove the sentence, social media use has the potential to result in disruption of the school environment and or the workplace and can be in violation of board policy in local, state, and federal law. As such, the board expects district staff to ensure all communications associated with their social media accounts are consistent with their role as district employees. Staff members will be held to the same professional standards in their use of social media as they are for other public conduct. If a staff member has a question regarding the appropriate use of social media, he or she should consult his or her direct supervisor or building principal for guidance. Unprofessional conduct may subject the employee to disciplinary action consistent with state law, federal law, and or board policy. Okay. We have now have an amendment uh, presented by Ms. Garris for policy GBEB. Um, she's made a motion on the floor. Do I have a second regarding her amendment? I'll second for discussion purposes. Okay, we now have a motion and a second on the policy GBEB. Um, board, are there any discussion points? I guess my concern, this is kind of a brave new world for us when it comes to social media. Um, and I can tell you as, as an employer, um, I'm a little frightened by the, the, the social media um, giant that exists um, and where um, where it can become problematic for the employer and the employee relationship. Um, so I appreciate the I appreciate the concern about about changing, um, I guess my question is directly when it says this potential to result in disruption, whose interpretation would that be, Mr. Stacy, based off of, I guess it's one thing to, to convict somebody of a crime, it's another per thing to convict somebody of the potential for a crime. And so th that wording does throw it off for me a little bit when we say potential for disruption because that can 
that's a lot in the eye of the beholder. Um, and so I guess my question would be, how, how is that determined? Under what mechanism would it be determined for potential? Well, potential of disruption, in my mind, is it's brought to my attention. I mean, again, I don't troll Facebook, so I don't know what's posted there, but somebody has looked at it and has some concern about it. And so then what we would do in HR is we would review that. We would determine whether we think it's a, an appropriate post or not. It, it's judgment on our part. And then we would communicate with that person if we felt that it's something that needed to be removed. Now, you know, everybody has the right for freedom of speech. The, what you don't have is freedom of speech free of consequence. Correct. And so that's what we would determine as an HR department, and we would work with our attorneys to make sure that, you know, we're not overstepping our bounds because I, I don't want to overstep my bounds. I guarantee you that. And so then at that point, we would make a decision about what to happen. But in, in all of the situations to this point, I don't know that we've ever had to terminate an employee for something that they put on, well, I, I shouldn't say that. We've had a couple of situations where we've had some situations with employees where we've had to make some employment decisions. Um, but it's not, the, the most common consequence is just having a conversation, talking with them, and then, then they take care of that situation. Earlier you had talked about pushing it down to the, to the lowest level possible. Would, would that be the still... conversation with the principal? Yes. Okay. So, so that's sort of step one, I yes. guess, is what you're saying. If it was brought to our attention, I would call the principal, say, "Look, this has happened." The principal would have the conversation with the teacher. If it's taken care of, then that's all that, that, that takes. Happen. That does happen. I mean, I've, I can speak from experience. Probably half a dozen times, I feel like we yes, had sir. a potential uh, to maybe remove an employee unless we took action or had that conversation, critical conversation. <coughs> and uh, I'd like to say I'd save six or eight people's careers. Well, That's and right. Mr. Oswald, I would say, to me, I read this more as a mechanism where the district is trying to protect the employee. Exactly. And, you know, because I did a little bit of research because I was just curious, um, and there's all kinds of data, um, but social media policies for organizations and companies have just exploded in the last 10 years. Um, and some of the data that I found, 80% of companies have, and this is on a, a, a very widely regarded uh, survey tool, 80% um, have social media policies and 70% of those companies have taken some sort of disciplinary action against an employee. But then when you kind of drill down the thing that, you know, I tell my children, my teenagers, young adults, 70% um, of just under 2,400 hiring managers when asked said that they check social media when evaluating job candidates and 54% did not offer a candidate a job due to red flags on their social media activity. And I feel like that, you know, especially because we have uh, young teachers and young staff members that this is a tool for the district and the school and the principal to mentor them and coach them in, because there, there's, as, as Dr. Guyton said, the, the um, social media world um, is, it's a perilous place um, and you might have had terrible judgment as a 19 year old and you have really good judgment as a 25 year old, um, and, but part of, you know, I think this policy is to help us as a district um, Protect. Protect the employees. I, I don't think, it, I don't look at this as a sword. I look at it as a shield. Um, and I think that's a very important way to look at these code of conduct policies. It's we, w we want to do everything we can to make sure that your job is safe and secure. And so this is the behavior that will help you keep your job safe and secure. So that's the way I look at it. And I guess where I land on this, I mean, when I became a physician, it was a decision that came with all kinds of benefits and cost, and it's a profession. So when people step forward and want to impact kids' lives, that's a calling, that's a profession, and with that comes responsibility. And whether you're the principal or uh, the food services, it doesn't matter. You're impacting kids' lives. And I don't know. I mean, I've got a kid, one kid in middle school and two kids in high school, and I don't know who they come in contact with. I mean, I, I know some of, of, of their teachers, and you know, but they, they are being influenced 
by those leaders at those schools. And, and what they post on their social media impacts the impression they leave with my kids. So I, I hear both sides of this. I, I get freedom of speech. But at the end of the day, they're educators, all of them. And they're affecting my kids' future and all of our kids' future. So I just I, I think we need it's part of what you give to become an educator, the, the um, privilege to educate our children. Any other questions or comments, board? Okay, hearing none, we'll take a vote on the amendment. We have a motion by Ms. Garris, a second by uh, Dr. Guyton. All in favor of making the amendment as proposed by Ms. Garris, please say aye. Aye. Okay. One. All opposed? Opposed. Nay. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have one, two, let's see how many we have today, five. So uh, the, the amendment fails. We now go back to the, the policy as originally stated. We're back. This is policy GBEB, which was presented tonight by Mr. Stacy. Are there any other questions or comments regarding this policy? Okay, hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of policy GBEB as presented tonight, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the, J.D., did you vote, you agreed with it, you voted mm -hmm. on it? Okay, so we have, the vote is unanimous. So we will now move, hold on, let me get back over here. Yeah. Okay, y'all bear with me. We've got a lot going on here. Okay, we are now going to go to 11.6, which is a student travel request. I do have a recusal from Ms. Garris. She has a child who is participating in one of the field trips, so she will be recusing herself. Do I hear a motion to approve the 27 student travel request as presented by Dr. Talley and the principals? Madam Chair, I move the board accept the 26, you said? 27. 27, I'm sorry, travel uh, request as presented by Dr. Little and the senior leadership team. Okay, thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments, board, regarding these 27 trips? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, and any opposed? So the uh, vote is five in favor, one recusal, and no oppositions. So make sure I write that down. Okay, at this time, he's back. Sorry. <laughs> he's hanging in there, y'all. He's hanging in there. So we are now going to go to 12.0, which is our uh, superintendent's update. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Little to start that update, please. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Smith, I will say my wife is at probably at home laughing right now because her idea of being sick means she paves the driveway and redoes the roof and, and <laughs> does everything else. But let me get a cold, and it's like the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> so I apologize for the man flu that I'm currently experiencing. Um, the, um, you know, as a superintendent, um, these superintendent updates, uh, I always try to mix in a few new things. And so tonight we actually have a, a really exciting uh, presentation. Um, it was my privilege and pleasure to speak with um, at the lobby day and just had a, a great experience. Um, and I would like to introduce a number of our teachers who were there that day. And I think they're just going to give us sort of a, a, a synopsis of what happened and, and uh, kind of where things are. So it's my privilege and pleasure tonight. I think, uh, Elizabeth, are you going to be the, the lead person here? Uh, She's a Spanish teacher at Lexington Middle School. We also have uh, Mr. Casey Calhoun here. Uh, they're, they're principals here as well. And um, so we're going to just sort of see what happens here. We've never really done this before, um, but that does not stop us from trying something new and different. And we're going to ask that you all stay on the mic because we are recording this for the YouTube channel. So we need for everybody to, be, to talk on the mic, if you don't mind. Great. First of all, thank you for everything that you do. We're going to kind of tell you a little bit about who we are first. I'm Mark Garner. I've proudly taught the past 13 years in Lexington 1 at Lexington Middle, Lake Murray Elementary, and Pleasant Hill Elementary. Before that, I was a substitute for four years, starting at age 18. I'm a graduate of Lexington High School, and both of my parents are retired Lexington 1 teachers with a combined 80 years of experience. My wife's a literacy coach in Lexington 1, and my sister's also a teacher in Lexington 1. I'm currently social studies department head, sixth grade team leader, teacher-led professional development facilitator, mentor teacher and mentor trainer. I'm a 4.0 teacher evaluator. I'm poverty certified, uh, the French exchange coordinator. I'm a member of Lexington One's uh, aspiring assistant principals program. I'm also the father of two future Lexington One students. And a good weightlifter. 
I, I, he really can I did not prepare him. an autobiography, Mark, but um, <laughs> I, uh, too, come from a long line of educators. My grandmother, my aunt and uncle, and my mother, who just retired after 40 years of service in public education. Um, I'm a 12-year Spanish teacher. I'm at Lexington Middle. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Hello, I'm Kasara Boyder. I'm Kasara Boyder, and I am the German teacher at Lexington Middle. My name is Tyler Pittman. I teach Latin at Lexington Middle and a new class I'm super excited about called Project Earth, it's sort of uh, an environmental studies, ecological approach to all things that kids are interested in. And thank you, Casey, for letting me do that. <laughs> and I'm Mariel Taylor. I'm the elementary school teacher here. I'm at Lexington Elementary School and I teach first grade and I've been there for four years. Um, I was in Richland, too, for four years prior to coming here, um, so eight years in education. I'm Megan Arcovio. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, but I moved here about 14 years ago. My first job was at Lexington Middle School, and I've been there for nine years now teaching English. And um, I was just going to start by saying how um, just really proud we were at Lobby Day to have you, Dr. Little. Our superintendent there speaking to everyone and just um, we were just really proud to be there and just to see that you supported us and encouraged us everybody that was there and um, it meant a lot to us and um, you said this that day we have a moral obligation to advocate for our public education and it just speaks to all of us to our core as educators and um, we just want to say thank you so you are much. very welcome. Thank you. That's very kind. So another quote attributed to Dr. Little um, that he said at Lobby Day, teachers often underestimate the power of their voices. When you speak, people listen. Um, at Lexington Middle, our principal has implemented what we call advocacy, where we teach our students the power of their voices and how to use their voices in, to make a positive difference in their communities. And that's what we're hoping that we're modeling for them. Um, we got to speak with some of our elected officials at Lobby Day, and it was just really cool to be part of that legislative process and, and speak with them and kind of share some, I guess, concerns that we as teachers have and just kind of educating them a bit as to what issues we face day in and day out on the classroom. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, public education has been underfunded for quite some time, and so that's a huge concern for <coughs> us. Um, however, we're looking at one of the largest surplus uh, in terms of budget ever in South Carolina history. There's a $1.8 billion but, uh, surplus in the budget, $850 million of that, which is reoccurring. So one of our main priorities, I think, um, is, is really working to advocate for increasing the base student cost, which is really the lifeblood of our schools, um, because it will help us to meet the needs of all of our students. As educators, we're concerned about legislation being put forth in the State House. It'll have a long-lasting impact on public education in South Carolina. At a time when teacher recruitment and retention in South Carolina is experiencing record numbers of teachers leaving the profession, nowhere near the number of replacements on the way, all the while student populations continue to grow, public education needs public support now more than ever. We're not only concerned about the legislation being put forth in the State House, but also the negative rhetoric being put forth by many of our elected officials in the State House directed toward the noble profession of teaching. So one of the things I wanted to do more than anything was take a look at the bills themselves. Uh, Right now, what we're seeing is that uh, several smaller bills are being proposed that contain a lot of the same language and a lot of the same uh, really detrimental proposals. And while everybody is sitting around debating the main bill in question, smaller bills like Senate 556 are being put forward, and they have a lot of, uh, a lot of problems for public education, most notably the diversion of funds from public school to private schools. This bill in particular, this proposal, has no, nowhere in it the word voucher, but it is a voucher bill. It's about taking money away from K-12 education and putting it towards private school vouchers. Uh, I went through and kind of highlighted some areas of concern uh, that stood out to me as a teacher. I'm hoping I can leave this with you guys, if that's okay. And uh, that's it for my piece. Thanks. 
We were so, we felt so much support and encouragement when we saw Dr. Little at Lobby Day, but we know that we have a long way to go if we're really gonna improve education for all of our students. Um, I know that teachers are working really hard to make our voices heard, but we see this as a collaborative effort um, for all stakeholders, sorry. <laughs> um, we need community members, board members, parents, teachers, children, everyone to kind of use their voices in support of public education so that we can do what's best for all of our students. Thank you so much for your time. We thank really you. want to thank you. Go ahead. No, no, that's what I was going to say. I mean, thank you so much that for um, for advocating. And I love when people quote me. So y'all do that anytime <laughs> you want to. I, that just tickles me to death. I, uh -huh. I always let my wife know when someone's quoted me. So that's good. I think he feels better. You I guys did, made him feel better. Me up a little <laughs> well, bit uh, the font they used made you look a little like Dr. Seuss up there. Yeah, so I, I, mean, I felt like there I, was I a got thing going on. Yeah. I told them that I really struggled with the red tie because as a Tar Heel fan, we don't have a lot of red in my closet unless it's Gilbert Indian colors, right? That's, that's about all I have in, in my closet. So anyway. Do you mind if I ask them a question real quick? Sure. Okay. So I, mean, um, I don't mind. No, I don't mind. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, the school board association has um, coming up uh, lobby days for school board members called Two Days at the Capitol. And they split the school boards from the state up and half go in March and half go in April. And our uh, district goes in April. Um, and we will meet with our senators and representatives. If you could pick like the two biggest things that you would like us to advocate what would they be? Because it, there's so much out there, and I feel like there's a lot of energy on the, like you said, the big things. Um, well, you, you don't have to think of it right this minute. You, y'all you, can collaborate and, and get back with Anne Marie. I mean, I, the school fundamentally. Yeah. Make, I mean, that, you know, brings up a lot of other things that, like I said, if we're going to do something, it's going to be possible, and we're able to get these people to talk. Okay, good deal. Thank you all again. Y'all have certainly made the evening. Um, so, um, Mr. Salters, I hate that you have to follow that, but once again, you are following a great presentation. Um, tonight I want to uh, bring you a, uh, an update. Uh, we talked about um, Centerville Elementary School. I want to bring you some pictures there of the school um, under construction. Uh, and so we are making some good progress out there now. Um, the weather has will, will hold us up some this week, but we... We do have some um, areas under roof, um, and you can see those here. Uh, we are starting to see some of the brick. Um, Y'all are going to miss the really good part when I talk about the TIF. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so we're starting to, to see some brick uh, being laid around the outside of the first wing here. Um, and, you know, we're, we're getting close to having some um, steel set over the cafeteria. And the uh, um, we do have steel and and some deck set on on this wing as well, and then back here in the in the back uh, where the uh, main electrical room is. So um, there's another angle of of that coming out of the ground, and then uh, from the ground, this is the main entrance area. Uh, some of the the timbers uh, that make that main canopy are are in place now. Um, this is looking down one of the hallways. Um, the uh, hallways look very narrow. They're not. They're the same width as our, our other prototypes. It's just a, kind of an optical illusion there because there's no roof and other things there. Um, this is looking down the C-wing, as we call it, hallway. Um, and then this is in the um, library. So it's a clear story that um, will be built up to. Um, it does have a uh, deck on it as well. And, um, Eventually, we'll get some uh, books in there, so we're excited about that. This is the uh, stage opening in the um, cafeteria, and uh, to the left would be the gymnasium area, and that's a shot of that um, opening there. Um, a movable wall will be there um, that you can expand and, and use for overflow into the cafeteria. Moving on to Pillion Middle School. Uh, Pillion Middle School started um, a, a few weeks after uh, Centerville Elementary School. Um, it's 220,000 square feet, um, or 210,000 square feet. Um, 
Uh, Centerville is 128,000 square feet. Uh, this facility is two-story. We have um, roof over the majority of the facility now. Um, and we do have um, cap sheet, which is like the final roofing phase, that white roofing reflective uh, cap sheet there over um, a good portion of the roof as well. Um, we'll be setting steel over the gymnasium and, and um, theater here soon. Uh, you recall this plan was flipped a little bit um, with the gym being on the uh, outside of the building versus um, at Beachwood, the gym is, is in this location. So um, interior shot of the cafeteria probably looks very familiar uh, as the prototype from Beachwood. Um, looking down onto the stage and the serving lines there. Uh, this is the interior um, main entry space there. So eventually the secured foyer will be at this location here. Um, and then we've got brick uh, around the building. We've got our um, main mechanical units already set. Um, and brick, you can see on, along the exterior of the classrooms. Um, and they're ready to set windows. And we'll start that process uh, later this week. Um, there at Centerville. And then uh, this is looking into the cafeteria, uh, that large um, glass wall uh, entry there. And we actually have our kitchen hood set um, at uh, Pelley Middle School. So that's a big, big step in the process. We're very excited about that progress. Mr. Salters, I was um, in Pelion on Saturday for uh, Mr. Haggard's funeral. And I, when, anytime I'm in Pelion, I drive by the site. And it's really astounding that that looks like a school already. I mean, it, the progress on Pelion Middle is just amazing. It's, it's got to be so exciting for that community because it just is going to be a, a fabulous facility. There, there's supposed to be um, a mid-year opening, but I keep uh, joking with the contractor that they're going to be open in August, and at this rate, they they, they probably will be. Uh, so we're, we got our fingers crossed. Um, they're doing a real good job out there, and it is very exciting for the for the community. Um, now, one one question that I've kind of gotten out in the community is with the use of the prototype design, are you seeing large changes that are occurring as we get, you know, two and three under our belt, or are they kind of more nuanced, just a better process, better way to do it? What what are you kind of seeing there when you're working with the, the GCs? Uh, generally speaking, it's, it's you know, nuanced things. Um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll highlight constructability um, issues. You know, when an architect draws something, they don't necessarily think about always how it's constructed. Sure. Um, or there may be a better way to construct it that, you know, newer technologies come out or whatever. Um, and so constructability sometimes comes into play, um, but most of the time it's moving a door here or there or increasing the size of a closet or, or reconfiguring some storage that may or may not uh, function as well, um, increasing a ceiling height. Um, you, you know, that it, one office, you, you pointed out yeah, that we, the teachers pointed that out to you, that yeah, the office at Beachwood need to be flipped. Yeah, we flipped an office at, at Beachwood in the, in the, um, in the counseling advisement area. We raised the ceiling height of the course and band rooms, uh, slightly, um, and, and pushed the walls out there just a little bit. Um, once you get in and use the space and you have the storage and materials in there, um, you know, you realize that eh, maybe that's maybe that does need to be scaled a little bit bigger. So those types of things are really um, very minor um, in the in the overall scale of a project. But that's that's really what happens. Now at Pillion, where where you flip the gym uh, as compared to Beachwood, was that specific to just the Pillion site? So uh, and it's um, set up better. It, so that was the original design of the building, and so at. Um, at Beachwood, you may recall, we have a retaining wall right off the end of yeah. uh, that gym area. And so it, it wouldn't fit the other way. Um, and so we, um, I can kind of go back and tell you, we we have, these are the locker room spaces and that jut out wouldn't fit because the retaining wall comes in. And so we had to put that um, gymnasium area kind of back here, right. there. Um, and and this, this was the original, uh, layout and of course it, it works here um, because we weren't encumbered by a retaining wall. So, uh, so we it was went actually back the opposite. Mm -hmm. It was the site at Beachwood was the was kind of it dictated the, the, the site adaptation. Okay. That's right. And then at Lexington Middle School, we plan to to build this this version. Um, and that is sited so pretty in Pillion. Yes. I mean, when you drive by, that that is just beautiful the way it sits out there. Yeah. So we have some other improvements going on at Pillion High School that we're uh, also excited about. Um, our track, uh, which is actually located adjacent to Pillion Middle School, has been um, 
uh, redone. We, we've got the, the black uh, asphalt surface on the track. Uh, we're, we're waiting um, for uh, one area of the track to dry out. It's, it's shaded and we're having some, some um, difficulty with all the rain getting it to dry out so we can put the final surface down. But what you're looking at here is the actual new construct uh, concession building locker room building there at the track uh, facility. So uh, real excited about upgrading that um, for the students there in Pillion. We ran into the track coach Friday night, and he said he goes by every day, and quote, unquote, I have to pinch myself. I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah, they have an outstanding program there, and they, <laughs> this is a – Coach uh, Yep. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully they'll run faster. That's right. Um, so this is an, uh, a small addition at the um, – uh, football, uh, soccer stadium where, where they um, play those events. And this is a visitor um, locker room space. It also um, function as the women's uh, soccer locker room. Uh, Pillion High School doesn't have a men's program. <clears throat> and so, uh, but, they, but they'll use that um, for the women's locker room uh, for soccer. And then in the fall, it'll be a visitor locker room for um, visiting teams for football. So. Um, you can see the footings have been paved, uh, poured there, and uh, that's coming coming out of the ground. And then in the back, uh, we have the weight room and wrestling room addition. Um, and you can see we're, we're starting. We set door frames and window frames, and uh, walls are coming up there. So good progress being made um, at that facility as well. Um, so these improvements really um, we're excited about uh, opening these up here soon at, at Pelion High School. And of course, you can always track our progress on the on the website um, for all of our projects. Um, the links there in the presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Okay, <coughs> Dr. Little. Sure. So, um, again, I apologize for some of the heavy lift tonight, but um, one of the things we've talked a little bit about is um, our relationship with the town when it comes to that land swap. And so we really felt like, um, you know what, Mr. Salter, if we did forget one thing for your operations update, uh, Mr. Calhoun is here tonight, and we spoke to uh, discuss what they presented to us. Yes. Um, and actually, um, one of the ideas that we, I'm glad you mentioned that, one of the ideas in, in our um, operations update that um, has actually come from Lexington Middle School, um, and, and we're working through that now, is, is the idea as we, look at siting a, a new campus um, over um, off of uh, Cherokee Trail and Old, old Cherokee Road. Um, the uh, folks at Lexington Middle School and, and Mr. Collins has brought to us an idea of some rebranding uh, that they might want to consider um, with that campus. And so, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we've talked to Dr. Little about and, um, and I think um, has some interest at the school level. And so we're um, we're interested in, in exploring that over the next few months and, um, and seeing where that, that may lead us. Um, and you, you may want to add more to yeah, that. Yeah, so um, w with some conversations that Mr. Calhoun and I had had, that he spoke to um, members of his school improvement team um, and, and some of the members of his community that talk about the rebranding when they move to the new middle school and what that looks like. So, for example, um, that may look like new school colors. Um, we have a lot of feedback now that it's a, a true feeder pattern into River Bluff High School that those parents don't like wearing their, their blue and gold over to River Bluff because that's big time rivalry. So we, we like those rivalries and we want to respect that. At the same time, um, Mr. Calhoun talked about the idea that uh, the Lexington L has a particular meaning. Uh, there's, a, there's a brand about what that looks like. Uh, and across the state, uh, the, the brand of Lexington, Lexington being uh, blue and gold is something that, you know, people know. And it's uh, about that kind of work. So uh, he's going to take a look at a couple of different things and, and I think share with us some feedback about uh, potentially um, some naming, some colors, uh, and some instructional programming, I think, is where we landed on some of those things. But um, so he's going to he, he approached that and I'm going to have him. I'm pushing it back on him, and he's going to talk a little bit to his community, gather some feedback, see if this is more than just a couple of people, um, see if he can really lead that effort um, there in his community. So we will, over the next few months, my guess is we will have an update in that. I don't want to put him on the spot here at the moment, but um, 
we'll try to have a, an update on that over the next couple months, and, and then the board will ultimately uh, make any decisions, um, especially regarding instructional program or instructional programs and naming that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'd, I'd forgotten that. That's good. Um, and so, as part of that, not as part of what I just said, go back. Um, as part of the land uh, swapping and some of our agreements, I thought it was a, was a good time to talk to the board about our relationship with the, with the city um, about these TIF agreements. And uh, so, Mr. Salters, if you would, because he hasn't had enough to do tonight, I figured one other thing was good. So, yep, um, be glad to update you. Um, and so, um, I think most of you were probably not um, on the board, uh, or some of you were not on the board when, when these agreements were entered into. So, you may not be um, very aware of what uh, is going on. So, I wanted to kind of highlight these for you. Um, we have two TIF uh, agreements with the town uh, of Lexington, TIF being tax increment financing arrangements. Um, the first of these agreements is Ice House. Um, and so this um, is the TIF district. And so when you enter into an agreement, um, typically a TIF uh, agreement is used to revitalize an area that um, has um, seen underdevelopment um, and maybe some decline over the years. And so um, we were approached about uh, establishing a, a TIF district uh, in the, in the downtown, downtown area of uh, Lexington. So uh, we got Main Street here, um, you know, <clears throat> and then uh, South Lake, North Lake uh, right here. So the courthouse would be right here. Um, and, and so this, this area and these parcels uh, make up that TIF district. And basically, um, I'll give you a rundown. Uh, there were two primary purposes for that um, uh, development. And the first was uh, Project Ice House, which is the Ice House Amphitheater. Um, that has been a very successful um, venture for the town. And um, the second um, project was development of the Old Mill Pond Trail. <clears throat> that was not very successful um, at this to this point uh, because that old mill pond trail was supposed to go around the beautiful pond uh, there at the mill, uh, which uh, got wiped out in the 2015 flood. So um, that actually is is on the books again, and they are um, they, they've done some work with the dam and are in, in the process of getting that uh, rebuilt, and and so that old mill pond trail. <coughs> around the um, the dam um, and that mill pond is is back in in play, um, and so just a few highlights of the agreement. It was initiated in 2014. Um, <coughs> our school debt service um, funding was excluded from the agreement, um, and so uh, we set a maximum amount or limitation of our tax increment. And that was uh, 3.4 million dollars. And uh, the plan duration, um, it sunsets in 2029. And basically, um, to this point, uh, or excuse me, to June, which was the last update the town had prepared, um, we have essentially given up $145,000 of, of revenue <coughs> uh, to contribute towards that borrowing effort uh, to, to, for the town to sell the bonds to be able to uh, do the construction um, of, of that uh, you know, amphitheater and, and uh, whatever engineering work they've done on the mill pond uh, there. So uh, we're, we're a good ways away from uh, the $3.4 million maximum cap. Um, and, and that should really start to pick up some as we see some other development. And really the idea behind this is that you, you, you hope that this will spur development in the area and you've seen businesses come in there, you know, Aladia's and, um, you know, the uh, O'Hara's Pub and some other things that have come in recently and, and axe been very throwing. successful. Do what? We're getting axe throwing. Uh, yeah, axe throwing. <laughs> um, and so um, some other uh, businesses that are coming in and, and really uh, spurring that development. So that's the idea behind this concept. So it, um, it has, you know, been effective um, to, to this point with the um, Ice House area. And so... Um, Another uh, TIF that we were approached about entering into was the Corley Mill Redevelopment TIF District. Um, and this area is an area specifically uh, located across the street from uh, River Bluff High School. This is all River Bluff High School. 
Fry Road is right here, so our property starts here and flows down, um, basically down to the creek here. <clears throat> and so this was a very specific area. Um, this was what used to be the Corley Mill Duck Club um, in, the, in the duck pond. Um, and so when you ride down Corley Mill Road and you, you cross that bridge where this, um, this is where a lot of the flooding uh, frequently occurs in that area. Um, but this area was, was slated as, as the TIF district. And so there really hasn't been a lot of development there yet. Um, but the, the idea behind this TIF was to uh, provide for construction roadway improvements along 378 and Corley Mill. And so the, the main reason the district um, agreed to enter into this TIF was to be a good partner and, and um, try to support the road improvements in that area, demonstrating our, um, our impact on, on those, uh, those roads every day. This agreement was initiated in 2017. Um, again, we ex exclude our debt service on, uh, from this. This particular um, increment uh, limit was $3.8 million, and it actually goes out to 2036. And so to date, uh, we've only um, contributed six, uh, $6,400 worth of revenue as of June 30 um, to this uh, increment. So uh, really not a lot of development has occurred in this area, so we're not seeing uh, the owner-occupied revenue that um, that would come from that. And so the um, current project that they're working on uh, that will be funded from this is the sunset split, as they call it. Um, and basically that's where um, it's a similar concept to what we worked on a number of years ago, um, where there's a road that goes behind McDonald's um, and uh, kind of picks up, would start kind of at the um, Corley Mill intersection and go uh, behind the bank there, um, and uh, the branch bank, and then in front of the um, the uh, TD Bank warehouse area there, and come out basically down there at the Murphy gas station. You would you would be uh, heading towards Lexington on a, a two lane road that does that, and then the other lanes would be going you know towards Columbia. So it, it's just creating additional capacity uh, for in and outbound traffic, um, and so that's a plan that they're working on now, and that's. That's kind of the next target to be funded um, uh, from this uh, TIF uh, whenever you know the uh, funding comes in. So um, it's kind of funny we begged them to do that ten years ago. That exact plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so you know that's kind of where we are with those two. Uh, they'll, they'll be around a long time, um, and you know ultimately uh, we'll hopefully do some some good work in in, in those areas. So. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about about those two uh, TIF agreements. Any questions, board? Okay, thank you, Mr. Salters. Mm -hmm. Good information. Okay. I'm not on. Apologize. We had two school board members uh, to attend the National School Boards Association Advocacy Conference, and um, they're going to give us a little update from that. Okay, I'll start. Um, and and it, it on the minutes, I mean on the agenda. I apologize. I missed this. It's the advocacy conference. It's not the annual conference. And if you don't mind, we're going to start with a video that was produced by the National School Boards Association regarding the census. And um, Dr. Little, if 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 the you and the senior leadership team deem this is something we would like we would like to sure. suggest that this be shared with our parents um, because it's really a good video so Mary Beth it's important the census counts everyone because if they didn't get counted they would feel I think they would feel left out it's important that the census counts everyone because they wouldn't really much have money to like make schools. We could end up being jammed in trailers like at some far other school. It's important the census counts everyone because, well, why wouldn't they count everyone? The Commerce Department announced the 2020 census will include a question of citizenship. If a citizenship question were added to the census, up to 10% of the population would likely not respond. People were really afraid 
first of all, that if non-citizens put their information in the census, that that would somehow ultimately be used against them individually. A lot of people would not have filled out the form because they may be in a mixed status uh, family. But I always remind people that this is in their best interest for their community, for their neighborhood, for their school. The U.S. Census isn't just a population count. It helps allocate federal, state, and local funds to your community for things like hospitals, schools, and daycare centers. The resources that we get from the federal government, like Title I and funding for special education, school lunch programs, all of that is driven by the number of people in the community. So we immediately swung into action in terms of preparing an amicus brief, speaking on behalf of school boards, school districts around the country, emphasizing to the court the importance of an accurate count. A huge and unexpected victory today. The court temporarily blocked efforts to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. The Supreme Court here is saying that the government's explanation for why it put the question on the census form was invalid. The NSBA got its voice in there on behalf of schools, and it turns out that was the important voice. I think it tells us that that brief spoke to the Chief Justice. The um, National School Board Association representing school boards in every community throughout the country as an organization that has credibility on school funding issues, education generally, and so the court would certainly pay attention to that kind of brief. The Supreme Court decision was a major victory for us. We were thrilled with it, but it, quite frankly, was just the beginning. Uh, we're working now with the Census Bureau. We're working with partner organizations. And interestingly, and I think hopefully, working with local school officials all around the country and teachers and kids. The involvement of schools and teachers and students is crucial for the communities where we live, uh, the schools where our children go to. All of that is directly affected by having a census count that is real, that is thorough, and that is accurate. If I were in charge of the census, I would probably do something like we're doing, except make it more digital. You could just like post one thing on like Twitter or Facebook, and I mean, it could just be all over the USA like that. Now that all the cool kids are on there, I guess TikTok or whatever it is. If I were in charge of the census, I think that I would maybe do something like a commercial kind of like this so that everyone knows why it's important to be counted. So that was one of the big things, of course, this year was the census. And I'm just going to touch base on, um, we had a visit with uh, Congressman Wilson, and we also had a visit with Senator um, Lindsey Graham. And I'm going to let Anne Marie, because I'm going to brag on her in just a minute. But on our side, one of the things that came across that was real interesting that I'm not sure we would ever really want to do, but there's a big, there's a huge national movement to bring a class action lawsuit against these companies that promote vaping. Um, they brought it to our attention that they've actually advertised on Cartoon Network. And it was kind of scary some of the things they've done to hook our kids. And um, it's just really scary because our kids are so addicted. And uh, Dr. Guyton in his practice just sees it almost daily. These kids that started out thinking it was something cool and now they're addicted. So anyway, that's just something we're working on. One thing Congressman Wilson was super interested in was our big French award because he is uh, always trying to promote things globally, and he just thought that was so exciting that one of the schools in his district won that big award and that we are doing so much with uh, immersion and languages and promoting global citizens. Uh, the other thing we really worked with them on, of course, was uh, anything they can do to help us with the infrastructure bills that are going forward. We say this every year. Um, we would love more funding for infrastructure. I know Mr. Salters would, um, because uh, the one thing we really hit home with them about was that's how we can improve our security measures is getting more funding for infrastructure bills. And then, of course, always fully funding our schools. It's interesting that the teachers spoke about that tonight because that's something we always hammer home. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Anne Marie, but before I do that, I wanted to start because I really wanted to brag on her. You know, she is our advocacy uh, representative on this for our team. 
and she had the most unique opportunity, and she really hit a home run. And I'm going to let her share because it's, it's so exciting that one of our board members basically triggered this. So I'm going to brag on Anne-Marie and let her share what happened. That's an introduction, isn't it? <laughs> um, so we were meeting with Senator Graham, um, and there were about eight or ten board members from around the state. And one of the topics that um, – so this, this advocacy conference that we go to, it's two days of, I mean, like 7 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m., drinking from a fire hose. Um, I can share with you the legislative priorities for the National School Board Association, um, and it's, it's um, helping us fill our heads with all of the details, the current situation on um, – priorities for school boards across the, the country so that when we go to the cap to Capitol Hill on this Tuesday we have back-to-back -back meetings with our congressmen and our senators to share with them as quick as we can what our priorities are and what we want them to do because there's so much of um, school, schools are really affected by the federal government and what Congress does um, and one of the big conversations this year was about the digital divide. We had a really great presentation on Sunday afternoon um, from an FCC commissioner, um, and she was talking about all the efforts that the FCC is doing to um, uh, bridge the homework gap. Um, and she provided a lot of statistics and information um, and talked about some of the things that they're trying to do at the FCC level um, to bridge the, you know, because um, so much of our country, students still don't, they don't have internet at home. And so that was one of our talking points. So when we're in the meeting with Senator Graham, um, one of our, the school board uh, members brought up the digital divide, and, and Senator Graham was a little bit um, scattershot. He, he was jumping around a little bit. Um, and I, had the I mentioned um, that you know, one of the things that um, has been discussed that we're actually already piloting in our district is Wi-Fi on school buses. Well, you'd have thought that we had just handed him, you know, a gold medal. He was so excited, and he kept coming back to it and kept coming back to it, and he said, we can do that. I, I'm, I'm going to introduce a bill to bring Wi-Fi to all the school buses in the country because that's something that we can do. And he loved the term rolling study halls. We, we, we told him that we call them rolling study halls, that, that, that Google started that in our district, um, that it's been really successful, that it's a good way. You know, so many of our students spend so much time on school buses um, and then go home to school to homes that don't have Internet. And he instructed his uh, legislative director to go ahead and start working on it. Um, and then in the meantime, he said, President Trump will love it. It would be a bipartisan effort because this is not something that anybody could argue with. Um, and then within a couple days, I mean, there was immediate traffic with his office um, via email. And um, Senator Udall from New Mexico already had proposed a similar bill. Um, and so Senator Graham is signing on as a co-sponsor, which means it is bipartisan because Senator Udall is a Democrat from New Mexico. Um, and so it sounds like it's really got a lot of traction, and it's something that Senator Graham is very excited about. She signed a number, and it's off and running. So, and I, um, I just want to give her credit because she, he was very sick that day. Not a little. Yeah. He was very sick that day, and somehow Anne Marie got was seated right beside him. And I mean, he was hacking and coughing and sneezing. A germ magnet, right, <laughs> right on her. <laughs> And she, when she just launched into this, and then also we found out that Greenville County has recently put Wi-Fi on 300 of their buses, and one of their board members was able to give him some dollar figures, and the dollars associated with, with the results are pretty minimal, actually. So, I mean, he just went crazy. And in fact, they contacted us before I think we even got back to remind us to send the information to Senator Graham. Well, and, and actually it was interesting because Senator Graham's office, before we had even left Capitol Hill, had tweeted about it, and the FCC commissioner, uh, her office, saw the tweet and contacted the dire executive director of the National School Board Association and said, hey, let those South Carolina people know that they've got Senator Graham on something, and we really appreciate it. So it was really neat to be able to work um, with folks from all around the state to hopefully make a difference for students all around the country. For, for students so. everywhere. Um, and I'm just gonna, I was going to mention a couple other things, and I know he's counting minutes. Um, but um, some of the other priorities are STEAM education, um, and one of the big things that we always talk about is IDEA um, and IDEA funding. And as you all are all 
in the know on this, but it, um, IDEA was signed during uh, the Nixon administration, and the, um, the commitment of the federal government to IDEA was that the, um, federal funds would cover 40% of the cost of the mandates in IDEA. Well, it's never been above 19% funding, and it's currently at about 14% of the, f of the required. The ma we don't have to do 14% of the mandates. We do all the mandates, but only 14% of the funding. And so I had um, Mr. Stalkers send me some um, data, and I shared this with um, Congressman Timmons from Greenville and Congressman Wilson and um, somebody else. Um, but um, the difference for just our district between the 40% that we should be funded and the 14% that we do receive is $27,550,437, um, and that's annually. Um, if, and I just thought, well, you know, how can I make that translate into something that, you know, we're all familiar with? Um, so I took the number of certified staff that we have in our district and divided it into that number. And this, this is just, you know, speculation, but um, if we got that amount of funding from the federal government, um, it would permit us to give our teachers a $12,670 raise across the board, all of them, just that funding. Um, and so it, that is just something that we need to continually talk to um, our congressmen about. I mean, send them letters, call them, but IDE fund, DA funding is on the table every year, um, and they know that it's a priority, and they <coughs> still don't meet that commitment. Um, and it's just, it's, they are hearing the conversations about teacher retention, uh, teacher recruitment, uh, the valuing the, the teaching profession. And I think if we can equate that funding to the teachers in our classroom, I think that that is a way to, to move the needle on that, so. Well, thank you. Let's thank Ms. Green, because that was exciting, y'all. Okay, we're now gonna go to 13.0, which is new business, and we're gonna have first reading on policy GCK, GCK-R, Professional Staff Assignments and Transfers. And board, this is for your information only, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Stacy. Thank you, Chair and board members. Um, I'll bring to you tonight first reading for GCK, GCK-R, Professional Staff Assignments and Transfers. And basically what we've done is just updated this policy to re reflect the South Carolina School Board Association model policy. And then really um, the the gist of this is the rule, GCKR, and that's to make the electronic transfer process, use an electronic transfer process instead of paper. In the past, we just had an HR form they filled out to make it happen, and now we can do it online. So that's the gist of the changes there. Okay, thank you, board. Are there any questions or comments regarding that first reading? I've just got a couple comments. Um, I'll email these to you like I did last time, but um, GCK, draft 17, Mm -hmm. I guess that's the School Board Association markup. Um, in that, what, second paragraph, the first paragraph under assignment, reassignment? Yes, ma'am. Um, the second sentence, the superintendent or his or her designee is authorized to re reassign all personnel in the best interest of the district. An employee may be reassigned prior to the start of the school year. Um, that's repeated again a couple paragraphs down um, where it says, as indicated above, an employee may be reassigned. Um, and then a couple sentences down, it says the superintendent is authorized to reassign personnel. So I didn't know if that was on purpose or not. Like I said, I'll email it to you. Yeah, I, I think it is on purpose. I think that just looking at it quickly, the second one where it says, as indicated above, I think because it's talking about August 15th, because we have to let certified teachers know by August 15th where their placement is, but then there could be a shift based on enrollment changes. And so we might, you know, like we have a, a, an overabundance of teachers at one grade level and we may need to move them to another school to another grade level because of increased enrollment. That might be why it's said again, just to make sure that it reemphasizes that the superintendent does have the right to assign them at any time during the school year. Okay, and GCKR, an employee must have been employed in his or her present position for three years to be eligible to request a transfer. Oh, Oh, okay, Let's sorry. wait just a minute. Okay, um, anything else on, oh, excuse me, maybe were you doing GCKR? I'm sorry, I thought you said GCOR. Yes, GCKR. Okay, no, continue on. I apologize, that was my mistake. Okay, three years to be eligible for a transfer. Um, 
why three years? Well, that's it's interesting that you bring that up because we've actually talked with our principals um, just recently about that transfer policy. What we've really done is to try to protect areas like Gilbert and Pillion, which are a little bit farther removed from Lexington, and we get employees that would accept positions, say, in Pillion, and then the next year, once they got in our district, they're transferring to another school closer into the Lexington area. And so um, I think that policy really is in place to try to protect both schools out there because if you're changing every single year staff, there's a, a buy-in curve, an onboarding curve. If you're doing a particular initiative with the, your staff and you've trained them this year and then next year they leave, the person that comes in and replace them, you got to do it again. And so that's – and we asked the principals if we want to continue um, that practice, and they agreed that they would want to keep that three-year play in play. Okay. Do we have any numbers? Like, what happens if they just say, well, if you're not going to let me transfer, I'm going to – transfer to a different district like do you keep any numbers on anything like that um, we, we could probably draw some data but I mean that has happened we've had people that you know decide they want to go to another district um, but I don't it, I mean I can try to pull the numbers for I mean you. it's okay I was just wondering like do you see that happen often enough that, that not might often, be something we need not to often because okay. typically I mean we're for, we are fortunate to be in Lexington one people want to get into our district and that the teacher recruitment period just in January as a side um, it was amazing the number of teachers that came to that fair that left our district went to a neighboring district and now are wanting to come back the grass always looks greener on the other side and so um, and again, that was one of the reasons we talked with the principals about that particular policy, because what happens in, is that, and we've talked to principals about looking out for their colleagues too, because we have May 10th as our transfer deadline. That's when contracts are due back in. And last year we had May 30th as the in-district transfer deadline. So at May 10th, you couldn't get from another district, and then you had 20 days, and we had people moving, shifting, those last, and it really hurt some of those schools on the outside. We said, you know, that's not really fair to those principals we need to, or those schools, or the students in those schools. And so um, that's why it's there. Okay, thank you. That's it. And Mr. Stacy, I presume when uh, these teachers start at whatever school they're assigned, they're aware of that policy. Yes. So it's not a surprise to them, and right. they take the job with the understanding of that. That's right. I think that's pretty common even in the private industry because when places I've worked, there's, a, there's always been a requirement for how long you have to stay in that initial job. Because we, do we have it at the hospital? We do it at the hospital yeah, because we, we train, did. and so if you uh -huh. leave prior, you have to. Yeah, pay we back did it at training. Colonial yeah. Life too because you sure didn't want to lose them after you invested all that time and money in them. Okay, we're now going to go to 13.2, which is first reading of GCO, GCO R, evaluation of administrators, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Stacy. Again, um, just looking at our policy, the shift here is we are adopting South Carolina School Board Association model policy as written, GCO. That's why you don't see any red lines there. It's the, the actual policy. And the change is in the rule. And in the rule, what we've done is we've named PADEPT and outlined the process for evaluating principals. Um, we've also added, we did not have any kind of um, mechanism in our policies for evaluating central service administrators, and we felt that that was important that we do that, so we've added that process to that policy. Board, do we have any questions or comments regarding that one? Well, hearing none, we'll go to 13.3, which is first reading of policy GCOA, evaluation of instructional staff. Again, Mr. Stacy. Again, we um, have reviewed this policy. This was just updated um, in 11, 18, November of 18, but we recognize that we left out one small piece, and that's that we have um, teachers that are on annual-based evaluations, and we need a process to evaluate them through a formative process. These are teachers like our PACE teachers, year three or four teachers, alternative certification teachers, and our international certificate teachers. And so it just it makes a formal way to evaluate them. Any questions or comments for that one, board? Hearing none, we'll move to item 14.0, which is items for board information. Board included in your packet are monthly general fund financial reports for January 2020, monthly general fund budget transfers for January 2020, monthly capital projects report for January 2020, and monthly unauthorized procurements report for January 2020. 
And um, before we adjourn, I just wanted to mention uh, four, of, four of us took a trip last week. Um, Anne Marie, uh, Miss Green, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Oswald, and I all went up to see the new Spartanburg High School. And we had a driver right there that took us, and um, it was just a great experience. We learned a lot, and um, it was interesting to see some of the other designs that are going on across the state and uh, get some ideas. Very enlightening. Um, several of us attended the Courage Center breakfast uh, Friday morning, and I can tell you what, we are so blessed to live in this community. Mm -hmm. When you go, there were almost, I would say, almost a 1,000 people there. Would you say so, Ms. Green? About a 1,000 people there, all committed to helping our youth uh, battle addiction. And they even talked a little bit about vaping and uh, a lot about what's going on in our community, and it just was really very heartwarming. And speaking of such, I'm going to segue in, and I'd like to invite everyone. Um, there's going to be a vaping summit at Lexington High School on February the 24th at 6 p.m. Um, I highly encourage any, any of you, and if you know of parents or community members, I think it's open to the public. That's going to be very enlightening. And then um, one of our favorite, favorite events on February the 25th is the Excellence in Education uh, dinner where we celebrate the top 10% students in our graduating class this year and that is sponsored by our foundation and Gilbert High School is sponsoring that this year and um, if you've not attended that and you ever get an invitation you get a chance or if you have your own student that is gets honored it is a wonderful wonderful night so anyway based on that that's where we'll be so board is 15.0 um, it's adjournment do I have a motion to adjourn so moved Thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. He's been so quiet and all of a sudden. And all in favor, please stand up and thank you all for being with us tonight. Next week's public school board meeting. Good night.